an. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Very welcome, warm welcome to you today. Thank you for joining us. We're delighted to be hosting this event, which I think will be very thought provoking. And we're delighted to be doing it alongside City Pantry, who are our partners and will be speaking later. Um, and it will bring, a, I think, a very different thought process to the table today. Uh, we have some excellent speeches, speakers joining us from all across the spectrum of, hospital, of the food service sector. And the question we really want to pose today is what will the food service sector look like in 2021 or this time next year? And there's all kinds of questions to be posed. And we have a, we have a chat, so please feel free to ask questions as we go. We'll try to answer every question that is posed and we'll try to ask our panelists those questions as they come as well. It is said we are seeing five years of change take place within four months. Is that something you agree with? Uh, this would be one of the questions we pose today. 15% uh, of employees are forecast to return to offices pre-September or by September, rising to around 40 to 50% by the year end, and then rising to maybe 65% in 2021. Again, is this something you agree with, or do you think it'd be better than that, or do you think it'd be worse than that? Are work patterns changing once and for all? Are we seeing a whole shift that will change how everyone operates? And how will that impact on the food service sector as a whole as well and its models? It is said that in the city, which is obviously going to face quite a brunt at this point in time, 71% of non-essential workers will, are in threat of losing their jobs. I mean, that is a huge number, 71%. So how will that change things? Will we see chefs migrate from restaurants into the food service sector? Will they migrate into the hotel sector? Um, how will this recovery happen? Will we lose some great talent as well? Again, things we do need to ask. Um, will offices become three-day operations? Will they become collaborative hubs rather than the kind of offices that we see today? Now, we've held two hotel webinars over the last two months, and the overall view is going to take to 2023 before we get back to pre-COVID levels. Do we see the same generally across all business sectors? Do we agree with that? Do we think it's going to be faster? Do you think there will be a bounce that everyone has been talking about? Some argue that it would be those under the age, under 40, who will lead activity, the rebuilding of activity in London. Um, is that something again? And if that's the case, is it likely we're going to see younger leaders once again emerge? And will we see more entrepreneurs and innovation emerge as well? Will sustainability come take a step forward? Environmental, cultural, and social. One of the things everyone has been talking about during this period of time is how everyone's found community again. Um, and again, how will that impact on how people look at their lives? Will localism get more, a stronger vibe as well? And how will that impact on local produce and local farmers and what people buy? So there's lots of questions for us to work through. Um, Before we go any further, I just want to know, I want to really ask you some polling questions before we lead in. So I'm just going to introduce you to Lauren to ask the polling questions. Absolutely. We'd love to get your insight and opinion on a few things before we start. So the first question is, when do you believe that London will be back to pre-COVID levels? Do you think it's 2021, 2022, 2023? Or, I'm sorry to say, never. Well, 2022 seems to be the majority view, interestingly enough. 73% of people listening believe 2022. Fabulous, thank you for that. Next question I have for you is, one of the concerns in London is over the lack of international visitors, and I appreciate this is the same for a lot of major cities. When do you believe that the level of international visitors will be back to the same levels as pre-COVID? 2021, 2022, again 2023, 2024, 2025 or later? Very interesting. 48% think 2022 would be back 
well, international visitors. Question three is, it's argued that sustainability will become increasingly important post COVID. Do you agree with this? Yes or no? Wow, that didn't take long. <laughs> I know we were talking about sustainability long before COVID, but interestingly enough, 92% of you believe that sustainability will definitely be very important post COVID. Fourth question is many believe that the delivered in model will find real growth at this time. Is that something that you agree with as well? Goodness. Well, that is pretty resounding. 80% of you do agree that that is where we're heading. And then the last question for now is that we argue that food service plays and can play an increasingly important role when we're trying to re-engage teams and bring back people into the offices. Do you agree that this is the case? Goodness. So 92% of you agree that food service is an enormously important part. Thank you so much for sharing your insights. Over to you, Chris. Thank you very much, Lou. That's absolutely fascinating. Um, before we start, the World Economic Forum has come out this week and saying that if we think that COVID is bad enough, we are going to face a deep recession, which probably explains why most people are pointing towards 2022 as the time that we seem to be going back into recovery. It quotes, we're facing a recession, which will be far worse than the one we faced in 2008. And given the nature of the crisis, it needs to be all hands on deck and we need to use all the tools possible um, in our hands. Uh, so again, the whole point about collaboration and knowledge share is going to become increasingly important in our view. And that's obviously something we want to look at today. I have to say, there are also some weird and wonderful quotes coming out at the moment. I was particularly drawn this morning, just for a moment of humour, to one by a Russian minister who quoted, there should be no panic. You just have to work. Tractors will cure everyone. The field heals everyone. And if that fails, you must take a glass of vodka every day. So there's different views as well. There we go. Um, delighted now to introduce Julian, Julian Friss, who is going to talk about the vested model. Um, the, obviously, one of the big changes is how will models change? How will relationships change as we come through this period of time? So delighted to introduce Julian to come and talk. I'm just, I'm, there he is. Hello. Well, just when you thought it was safe to go out, along comes another webinar. But my aim today is to consider collaboration as potentially the new competition and get you to think that there is a way out of this. Ditch some of the old thinking, break out and make an, a real change. And today we focus on the what, not the how. And we'll look at the, in the context of COVID and recovery with the help from research from McKinsey Harvard, University of Tennessee, and from our own sources. Hello, I'm Julian Friss. I'm the Managing Director of Manella Davis, a forward-thinking management consultancy in the facilities management, catering, and retail space. Today, I'm spending about 25 minutes on presenting my thoughts on the way back to the new normal or next normal through collaborative contracting. Just get my slides to work. There we go. So um, I'll cover four topics, and these are current market conditions with a comparison of the top, medium, and low performing industries, the way we were, a nostalgic trip down memory lane pre-COVID, the impact of collaboration and introducing to vested outsourcing, and ideas for the future. Just a little elevator speech about Nella Davis very quickly. Uh, as I said, uh, facilities management, both hard and soft services that we, we work with, catering, hospitality and retail, procurement, contract management and estate management. We have been trading 15 years and act as a trusted advisor 
for many on business strategy solutioning, which includes outsourcing, insourcing and collaboration, audit review, uh, and a range of other activities that uh, help our clients. And they include the NHS, which interestingly is the fifth largest corporation in the world, Citibank, Freshfields, University of Reading, Columbia Threadneedle, VNA, RFU, many others. And our real aim is to make a difference for them. My background in FM and catering is uh, over a very long period. I won't name the time, but I've worked for diverse organisations such as General Motors, Sutcliffe, Sodexo. Uh, I managed Television Centre about uh, 15, 20 years ago and also was head of catering for the BBC before starting Nella Davis back in 2005. So this chart here shows uh, average economic profit by industry pre and post COVID. Clearly the, the, the blue line is the projection for uh, post COVID. The black dot is the position in 2018. So you can see the movement in industries from that, uh, those periods of time. The top six industries have raced ahead because they have already had heavy presence online or in pharma or biotech and are less traditionally structured. They are less reliant on legacy organizational constructs or engaged obviously in things that people want, such as uh, finding a vaccine. Our sector is sitting in the middle as much as what we do is determined by the success of others. So lockdown has curtailed most of our business, except maybe in healthcare, judicial, defense, and clearly the delivery services. Now, whilst governments have stepped in and the UK have been arguably in the forefront of this, help won't last forever. And any additional capitalizations need to be paid back. And the longer we stay in this stasis, the harder it becomes to recover. Then we see down at the bottom, the typically highly regulated businesses which struggle to adapt as they are locked in a predefined restrictive process. Also, some of these are at the end of their maturity cycle. So just um, to, to look at uh, the top performers, online delivery, telemedicine, somebody uh, in the health services invented the phone, you can now talk to your doctor, which is fantastic. Online education, remote working, clearly the media sector has done, uh, stormed ahead, particularly with online delivered services like Netflix and uh, Disney and so on. And if you're uh, looking more at catering, Gausto, Charlie Biggums and the uh, online delivery market itself has done well. What is clear is that these are increasing anyhow and COVID has just amplified it. So we had a problem before, it has just got a bit wider. Superfast broadband has delivered for us and this would have been unachievable with dial up 20 years ago. So the way we were, a bit like the old Barbara Streisand song, except memories aren't quite in the corner of our minds yet. But thinking about what was wrong with the pre-COVID world, seven points I've put here. Firstly, competition was good and healthy, but was also quite destructive. Uh, and when it's bad, in this particular case, there's a race to the bottom. We saw prices being slashed to push others out, bidders buying business and so on and so forth. It was not a good look. Walk down the high street, there were 20, 12 variants of an Italian uh, restaurant or uh, food shop, sandwich food shops, and how many do you actually need? I have spoken about uh, this many times, but the voracious predators of buying up companies to grow unnaturally, resulting in more sector oligopolies which ultimately limit choice, eventually leading to higher prices and lower quality. And this was particularly evident in the public sector uh, and those highly regulated industries, despite their so-called strict procurement rules. And as a result, it was all getting very muscular, very power-based, I got the money, I want your piece of pie, so I'll buy you out. This is not competition, this is market manipulation. So we became more and more obsessed with KPI uh, box ticking, just to, to protect our interests um, and you know, uh, think of car parking was, was a good example of how uh, you know, catch you out and get more money out of you for no, for no value. And trying to break the code to get into public sector work was impossible for SMEs, only the bigger companies seemed to have the algorithms. And then the process was blind to whether the, the buyer actually wanted that company and there was nothing about cultural fit. 
And then finally, I think uh, looking at this obsession around costs, companies highly geared, it was all a bit, uh, a bit of a balloon to pop. So based on that, you could argue that COVID could actually bring some good, but I know it's not easy. And I realize that people have lost their job. It's not fair and it's not your fault. So let's talk about vested. Um, in trying to find a new way of contracting, I have become more and more interested in vested. It is a concept de uh, developed by Kate Vitasek, who is an American author and educator and the lead researcher at the University of Tennessee. Her research focuses on the vested outsourcing business model, sourcing business model theory, the relational contract and collaborative business relationships. Um, she is a faculty member in the Haslam College of Business uh, and a graduate and executive education program at the University of Tennessee. There are around 70 vested contracts globally and with significant cross-sector interest, which is interesting. It is not a panacea, it's a commitment and it's something that parties need to really consider they want to get involved with. But I'm going to talk about it because I think this, is, this could be a, a solution for us. As we have discovered, we have been working in a very polarized, selfish world where we would prefer to dig ourselves in rather than develop trust and confidence in each other. Much of what I see is a territorial and siloed situation, particularly between the executive levels of an organizational uh, and an outsourcer organizations. Collaboration is more evident at the operational level where getting the job done and achieving the right outcomes is seen as the right thing to do. But it could be frowned upon because it's not uh, cost effective. However, organizations have kind of boxed themselves in and expect an outsourcer to predict and assume risk for the next five years of operations when the client doesn't even know what's happening next week or to create so many rules and procedures that their ability to work together is virtually eliminated because of cost, taboo about building relationships and cultural differences. Uh, a recent quote in the Harvard Business uh, Journal uh, summed this up, and this was authored partly by Kate. And she said, companies understand that their suppliers are critical partners in lowering costs, increasing quality and driving innovation. And leaders routinely talk about the need for strategic relationships with shared goals and risks. But when contract negotiations begin, they default to an adversarial mindset and a transactional contracting approach. They agonize over every conceivable scenario and then try to put everything in black and white. A variety of contract clauses, which you probably will be aware of, such as termination for convenience, which grants one party total freedom to and to end the contract after a specified period are used to gain the upper hand. However, these tactics not only confer a full sense of security because both firms switching costs are too high to actually invoke the clauses, but also foster negative behaviors that undermine the relationship and the contract itself. What Kate has identified is that there is inherent flaw in the business model. When we buy a good or service, we tend to procure from a range of suppliers and that can be quite prescriptive about what we buy. We specify what we want, sometimes down to the most granular detail, and we set out exactly what we think we want based on historic data. We ask suppliers to quote against an output spec, but in reality, the pricing is all about inputs. They give us a unit price and we try to fix as much as possible. However much we research and try to nail it down, we can never get it quite right. So there are immediate disparities. As a buyer, we can end up assuming the risk for the product, location, timing, quantity, a whole load of factors, um, but thinking we have empowered our supplier to do this. You can see the paradox. It goes to market and bidders respond, some underbid and win the contract, and then there's five years or so of misery where the supplier tries to recoup its losses and the client side watch every move. Whilst we try and secure a comprehensive price, inevitably shortfalls need to be made up and the contractor sees that an opportunity to get its money back and this activity trap, as it's called, eliminates any value you thought you achieved at bid stage. And this is called shading. 
So making any amendment is an uh, making any amendments is an ordeal when trying to agree variations or change control. A lot of money is spent on negotiating, which probably outweighs the benefit of making the change in the first place. It's like you buy a conservatory and you've assumed the windows included and they're not. Builder says that there'll be extra and by that time the footings are in and there's no turning back. You've got the cough up. Collaboration works on outcomes. It is uh, on a, it's built on a common approach where all parties work together for a common aim. It's an incentivized model whereby the supplier earns additional profit through innovation, gain share and empowerment. To get to this point needs a significant amount of business process mapping, trust and confidence to ensure that your partner is with you. I can hear my legal colleagues throwing their hands up in horror at the thought of agreeing with a partner rather than determining specific requirements and so on. Why would you trust them, they would say. What is clear, none of us knows what's going to happen in two years' time, let alone next week. So the whole process stifles innovation and agility. It is then perpetuated for eternity in the cut and paste world of rebid. What COVID has done has highlighted these particular performance-based industries, which are inflexible to change and challenge. We see that with the low performance, uh, like the transport, energy, utilities, and bank sector, and they're all highly regulated, intransigent businesses. Quite frankly, if they don't change and adjust, they're screwed. As caterers, this is not good news for us either, because they're a big market, and if they don't move, we slide down with them. The thing about collaboration is that it potentially eliminates this territorialism, unfair competition, and what I call performance stalking. It focuses on empowerment, working together, and trust. It is not just about outcomes, but belief, culture, and attitude. As Kate said earlier in the HBR article, it's all rosy at bid stage between procurement and the sellers, then it turns sour when everybody wakes up to the grim reality of the win. The concept for Vested is what's in it for we rather than what's in it for me. It's about all parties winning together and occasionally losing together. A good example, for example, is uh, P&G, um, Procter & Gamble, who appointed JLL as their property and facility provider. Originally, they had a very much performance-based approach, which ended up with a confrontational relationship driven by tough penalty-laden KPIs. They decided to embrace Vested. It took them a couple of years to set up, but the result was that PNG Property volunteered to join JLL as they were better set up to run the estate than PNG, thus eliminating unnecessary duplication, working together. They developed a shared vision with guiding principles, and the ultimate prize was an effective, collaboratively run estate. I know in this or similar examples that organisations have saved up to 40% of their total cost of operation. And this is impressive. And when we think about total cost of operation, that's the cost of the service provision, the catering, the facilities management, and all the infrastructure that goes around from the client side. Another example is McDonald's, who, believe it or not, do not have contracts with their major suppliers. Some of them have been working together for over 60 years. They share innovation amongst themselves, but sign an IP deal so they don't share with, say, Burger King or KFC. Success of their, the success of their supply chain is that they never run out of chicken because of changing logistics supplier, as we heard a couple of years ago with KFC. And another interesting fact is that actually McDonald's and their partners invented the chicken nugget, not KFC. So all parties become aligned to the same quantifiable objectives. The rules of the game are clearly spelled out through the contract. Yes, there are contracts, but these are relational, not transactional. Most importantly, contract incentives encourages supplier innovation. So the customer wins, they get higher service levels, procurement win because they get the best price, which is not loaded with risk premiums and the like, and the supplier can earn more by bringing innovation to the party. A vested relationship 
to sum up, uh, shifts from a transaction to an outcome-based business model focusing on results. We're in it together, in it for we. It moves from beyond strategic supplier to developing carefully crafted collaborative agreements. It creates value through win-win solutions. So grow the pie, not fight over the pie. If you go to a vested uh, uh, session or you look online, there's quite a lot of proliferation about this uh, concept, you'll hear about the five rules. I shall go through those just to give you a, a flavor of what they're, they're, they're looking at. So firstly, outcome-based versus transaction-based business model. So most relationships, as we said, are transaction-based, and this could be a cost plus or a fixed price where service provider gets a transaction fee for every activity performed. Vested moves into the outcome-based uh, Approach where the service provider is paid on achieving results, not just performing tasks or activities. We have to accept that the cost is the cost is the cost, but working together, we can fight that. Focus on what, not the how. There's something called Joy's Law, says that no matter who you are, most of the bright people don't work for you. Clearly defined or measurable desired outcomes, as someone said, you've got to be very careful if you don't know where you're going because you might not get there. Rule four is the pricing model with incentives that optim optimize the business. So 87% of economic growth is driven by technical change that comes from improvements in business process or technical improvements in products. The vast majority of today's commercial contracts are for labor and physical capital rather than for innovation and problem solving. And fifth rule, insight versus oversight. So less about me, more about we. Rather than getting a service provider to meet my needs, we find a way to meet our mutual needs. Now we say, it's in the, if it's in the contract, it's the service provider's problem, rather than we work together to achieve performance and compensation goals. The benefits of collaborative working are that parties will be vested in each other's successes and on focus and, and focus on intended results, not activities. This drives trust and innovation. Competition is focused on solutions rather than just activities and products. Ultimately, a more efficient model pulling in the same direction can reduce total operational costs, but improve returns on investment. As I said earlier, it removes duplication because everyone is incentivized. They're pulling in the same direction. There's significantly more creativity and there's ownership. This translates into better outcomes for all. So the most popular um, organizations that have uh, adopted it, as we can see uh, in these sectors, real estate, supply chain, technical maintenance and so forth. So it is very service focused, but it can be, it can be much as a business process as much as catering or a facilities management contract. So what happens next? So why do you think collaboration will work? As we have discovered, it's not a walk in the park. It relies as much on chemistry as it does a can-do attitude. Many people like the idea, but soon retreat back to the safety of transactional or output contracts. I know I've talked to quite a few of my clients. It is a, it is a, it is a real mind shift for them. Vested offers a detailed framework, but there are other approaches, but this is the most comprehensive. The research, training, toolkits, and support can be adopted to suit your needs, but it is a cascade approach and you step through a number of tests before fully engaging in a full collaborative deal. Cynics would say it's just a handshake deal. But exponents say it is the best business thing they've ever done. And companies like Ernst & Young, ISS, Compass, Sodexo, P&G, Intel, McDonald's, Microsoft, and loads of others are some of the many who have adopted or adapted to their purpose. So, Lay the foundation, set out what you need and consider whether collaboration is right for you. After all, the transactional approach might not 
be totally inappropriate, but it's it's another way of uh, meeting your requirements. But you need to find yourself the right partner. And that could be your current service provider where you have exhausted every avenue and the supply market in your sector is quite restricted. Once you've settled on your supplier, go create a shared vision and objectives. Remember what's in it for we. This exercise might be more far reaching than you think because both of you really need to believe that you are working jointly and both don't revert to type. But equally, there will be areas you will want to protect, but you need to be open and transparent about these. Guiding principles are critical. These are the cornerstones of the deal and these are embedded in the agreement. These dictate the shape of the service, the way it's delivered and how your cultures can be aligned. And within that, both your expectations and interests should be matched. Like a marriage, you have to stay aligned to make this work. There's always a danger that it all unravels when there's a new sheriff in town. So what are we doing? Well, six things we're focusing on our projects is um, developing collaborative working um, and, and, and perhaps some more uh, exponents of ISO uh, are aware of a uh, of a, a concept called ISO 44001, which is not as uh, rolls off the tongue like Vested. But what Vested does is provide you the tools. They spent nearly 20 years developing this and it is very impressive. We, we're keen to get involved and we're already collaborating with others to achieve this, this change in approach. Some of it's bit by bit. We're not all about global solutions. There needs to be greater engagement between the service provision and where ingredients come from, for example. We think there are other approaches for, say, a contract cater to deliver excellence rather than just another fixed price or nil cost subsidy contract. The right tech is key. Payment systems have significantly involved so much that they eliminate duplication, speed up service, provide significant useful data and people like to use them. Tech should always be supported, but not replace good customer service. Employer value propositions, uh, we've seen quite a lot of uh, discussion around this over the last few months. These are especially relevant in workplace catering where employers consider that by providing highly discounted meals add significant value to an employer's benefits, retention, motivation, and the health and well-being and as a lure to get them back in the office in the current scenario. Most of all, a simple act like this pays dividends for a company who will eventually see higher trade levels, less sickness and absence, better community spirit, especially when we're, as I said, trying to entice people back. And eliminating poor performance. This is not about the people. This is about performance and positively acting to turn this round from a low to a high performing company. Thank you. So there's plenty to think about. I don't know all the answers. What I know from my own experience is that an aligned approach works. My company works very much on a collaborative basis and our clients get great outcomes and we are rewarded with long-term relationships, referrals, recommendations and retention. I know that the transaction-based jobs are less rewarding for all and ultimately many would be better with a more aligned relationship. Thank you for your time. Julian, thanks very much indeed for that. Um, a few questions um, before you leave part, if that's okay. Um, you're obviously going around talking to clients about this approach. What kind of response are you getting? Uh, we're getting positive. I'll just stop sharing. Yeah, yeah we're getting very positive uh, uh, results. We have, uh, for several of our clients, we've actually brought Kate and the Vested team in to talk to them about the opportunities. And it's really opened their minds to how they can do things differently. And as I was saying in my presentation, this is not a, it's not a walk in the park, I can't just pull out that document and, and roll it out. It, it means that we have to sit down look and share, look at, it, it's, a, it's a bit like a, it's not like Alcoholics Anonymous, but it's about looking at what's the good and bad of what we do and how, how we can find something we have a, 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 a link with. And some of those projects are gonna take two or three, four years to, to achieve in those kind of circumstances, but they are, in, in quite intransigent sort of public sector type organisations. I have another situation with a, 
a contract caterer where we are looking to work together on working on sort of an in-house sol uh, solution whereby they will help with the customer service, the food standards, the tech, and that whole professional feel um, and, and, and mentoring uh, staff and so forth. So they have a different platform to play on and a lot more of that coaching and mentoring type of coach because it's about the outcome. Uh, and, and over time, as I, I use that example with PNG, the likelihood is that actually that is a good way of, of, of gaining business in the long term because they go, well, actually, we're doing this. You're better at it. You come and run it. So it's a, it's a steady relationship building type exercise. Um, others that uh, we're talking to show interest and they want to know more. So we're at the very early stages and there's a few of us that got together um, sort of like a, 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 a sort of a UK branch of it and we're trying to sort of spread the message a little bit more, get them comfortable to understand how it works, use some examples and we're trying to develop more in the UK um, because quite a lot of the examples are in Europe and, and I think that will be quite a critical one to translate into. What have you done in London? Yeah, so we're, 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 we're moving down that line and as I say, it's it's, it's changing the rhetoric and I think people are keen to want to do something different. Now I'm going to put you on the spot because we're obviously talking about 2021 mm -hmm. and actually how what do you think the changes are going what are we going to see over the next year? How, how do you believe the market's going to recover and to what level do you think we're going to recover? I think uh, I think that the, the voting that we had earlier on sort of summed up my view really We'll, we'll get to a point, we'll get to a point where uh, a, a half the people might go back on a certain uh, amount of days a week. I think they might switch around instead of working three days, four days in the office, they may do the complete opposite uh, and, and, and work more at home and then do one or two days uh, in, in, in the office. But see, it's quite compelling. If you're working in a team, it's all very well doing the Zoom thing and the MX, but sometimes you just want to be in a room and talk to people and I think that might push people over the line a little bit and I think also just a, a silly little thing is the, the weather changing, the nights drawing in thinking sod it I might as well go out and, uh, and, and let's get together. Um, you know obviously people are guided by what happens in the press and, and that swings from day to day. Now bearing in mind I also work in healthcare, I also work in uh, other sort of more critical key industries it doesn't affect them so much. They've had to put up the first flex screen and other kind of stuff. But what we're looking at there is um, is to put more back into their lot, uh, you know, to give them a better service and make them feel like they're wanted and, and, and so forth. So I think this is a really good time to really work on these solutions. Some might work, some might not. But I think together, I think together, uh, caterers working with the clients, working with the, with, 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 with the staff, the employees, I think they can lure people back with some, with some really good incentives. And you can see that's got quite a, a collaborative feel about it. It's, it's what's in it for we. We've got to stay in business. We've got to work together. And we respect your view about working from home, but I think it's about getting things moving. And if we can break the cycle with those low performing industries, that will help to you know, break the, 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 the log jam, getting things moving. There's stuff happening, the, you know, bids are coming out, so it's not all doom and gloom. I just think it just needs a bit of confidence building. Yeah, that's natural. Last question, and it's personal to you. Obviously, for consultants being locked down is particularly difficult, isn't it? Because a lot of your work in consultancy <laughs> is about learning and sharing ideas and seeing what's going on in the market. So how's the COVID thing affected you and how the way you think about things? Well, my dogs are very fit because we go out a lot. Um, but the, um, you know what, I, as long as I've got a, 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 a horizontal bit of wood that I can put my computer on and work, I'm, I'm absolutely fine because a lot of the stuff I do is remote from my client. I can communicate with them, uh, obviously, through various technology. The, the issue I have is not about the, the, the current projects I'm running because I can do those because they're a process. It's about, you can't live on fumes forever. And you've got to get out, you've got to engage with people, you've got to, you, you've got to talk to people, you've got, you've got to read the body language because what we lose, you know, my video is great, but actually it's that whole thing. And then talking to my colleagues about what they're thinking, 
sometimes it's a bit sti a bit stifled on here and just 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 chilling out and i think that that's the, that, that's that's the bit we are living in a slightly unreal uh bubble i can survive but as i say it's the longer term for for me and probably my consultants and colleagues is to is is to get out there to generate the the, the pipeline going forward so that's my okay. okay. no, that's very good thank you very much julian thanks okay. for your time today i know you've given up this time thank you very much indeed and now I'd like to welcome the operators into the equation, please. And turn on now, James Lawrence. Yeah. Just Simon, I think we're waiting for Mr. Esner. Thank you, thank you. Let me introduce the panel because uh, I think we're going to have the next hour or so between the two panels of some really interesting thoughts. So. Just running around, firstly, can I introduce Lawrence, uh, the Managing Director of Aramark, um, who I think will bring some really interesting perspectives. Uh, Simon Esner, very well known from his, as a co-founder of obviously WSH Group and as one of the kind of senior players of the sector. Um, James Griefham, Director of Bartlow Mitchell and Simon Houston, obviously coming representing the smaller businesses. And, and that must be an interesting challenge, which we'll touch on, Simon, in time trying to build a new business at Houston Hawks. So welcome to four of you. Um, Simon Esner, let's start with you. Um, very unfairly, but mainly as we kind of obviously published your interview yesterday. You were being quite bullish about the return, or you were being optimistic about the return. Yeah, uh, good afternoon, Chris and everybody. Uh, I, I was optimistic, and it wasn't just because of what was in my hand uh, <laughs> at the time of speaking with Lauren. Um, it was a beautiful sunny day as well. I think it's really interesting listening to Julian because living on fumes was something he just said. And uh, to add to that, I think people just need a little bit of confidence to realize that actually getting on a train, getting on the tube, a bus is not as challenging and as frightening as the mainstream media are portraying. And for me, and um, what drives my optimism is that I uh, find that the mainstream media are to blame totally for the COVID phobia that has perpetuated the United Kingdom. And I truly believe that through commerce, some of the great and amazing locations that I had the privilege to be involved in, and I can tell you a particular group where I'm a, a vested interest in, their like-for-like like sales just published this weekend, last weekend, were down by just six, that's zero six, six percent. Now that is the confidence of the customer, that is the confidence of the consumer going back into a hospitality environment where they feel safe, there is an emphasis on excellent technology, which is not a nice to have, it's an absolute requirement. There is a highly enthusiastic, extremely engaged and skilled workforce who are preparing and serving and looking after customers like no other industry can do. And my belief is, and what drives my optimism is that the food service sector will, through their own initiative, give the confidence to their clients, to their customers in the buildings, that they can return to the office. And I tell you, Julian said something so interesting. And I had a conversation earlier today with a, a colleague, we were sitting having a coffee. Um, in Germany, 80% of the office locations are back to normal. I, I refuse to use this new normal. I don't understand new normal. They're just back to normal. People are traveling on transport. I think someone said earlier on, and we were having a bit of a chat that it's a bit more challenging for London because we don't live as close to our offices and our places of work as many other European cities with their population. We do have a workforce that does need to use public transportation. However, that said, I absolutely believe if we can encourage through all of the good work that we do as hospitality professionals, the media <coughs> to stop being the uh, doom 
uh, sayers and to encourage positive news whenever we can. This will help our customers to feel more and more uh, happy about returning to the office because it's all well and good when you sit out uh, on your flat piece of wood, as Julian says, with your laptop and you can work at home. But it's a lovely sunny day today. Wait until it's a wet Wednesday in November. And if you have kids or you've got a dog like I've got and it comes in from the garden soaking wet, gives a shake and all the papers that you've been working on just completely get ruined. I think you're going to really wish you were back where you could grab a, a fantastic latte from the coffee bar in the restaurant. Everything's going to change. In-house dining is going to change. It will not look the same, but it will be there. James, coming in here, do you agree? Is it media-led or do you, and fear-led, or do you believe that there's a natural change taking place anyway? Uh, there's a natural change taking place. It's been happening for a long time, but I agree with Simon. Um, I, I really think we just need to absolutely start this economy moving again by getting back into work. I've been travelling in a number of occasions over the last you know, couple of months, and... Uh, I feel safe. Once you've actually got into a building, you feel really, really safe. We've sorted out all of those safety issues. Um, and actually, a, a, a number of our clients that have actually been open during this challenge, they started up by saying, look, we only really want just grab and go, you know, prepackaged meals. Give them two days and they want the menu back again. They want what they had before. Clearly, there's going to be some changes from logistics and um, things like that. But fundamentally, they, they, they really do need that um, catering environment um, to, to help them through the day, to help them communicate with their customer base. Um, I, I think it's vitally important. And, and, and hence, the, 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 the poll earlier on, 92% of people said that food service is an important part of trying to encourage people back into work. That is so true. We've got a real part to play in getting these offices back open again. But, they, but you're right. They will be very different environments. and We just have to adapt. Um, it's what's been happening and we're just doing it. Um, what was meant to be five years, we're just doing it in a couple of months. Again, let's, let's, again I'm going to put you on the spot here, James. Yeah. So when we're talking about change, quickly, what kind of change do you see? What real change? Um, from a catering perspective, uh, I think we're working that out as we go. There are lots of changes of what our, cl our clients and customers want. I think we're starting to really understand what's going to happen in those office environments um, and how they're going to use those spaces very differently. So um, the, restaurant will, the restaurants will be an important space. I think silo desks will probably be um, sort of being phased out. This is about having spaces that are available for people to communicate with their teams, um, uh, you know, get better ideas going. I think, you know, Zoom has been fantastic for a number of reasons. Um, but what it doesn't do, and I think you wrote in an article, Chris, that it doesn't get that bit before the meeting that you have in a face-to-face -face situation or the bit after the meeting, which is the real action and planning and getting people back into that office and giving them collaborative space to work, um, I think will, will make um, office environments far more productive. Look, you can't, you can't quote me, by the way, back. Oh, not okay. fair. <laughs> but, <laughs> not, but, but some progressive organisations have been doing this for a long time. I think a lot of companies are just playing a bit of catch-up, that's all. Lawrence, can I bring you in here? Do you share their views? Yeah, it's, it's really interesting, actually. And I think, um, you know, Simon has a, a great point. I think the press has played a huge part in, you know, suppressing that consumer confidence. And, and actually, when people get back into the environment, um, and, and actually see that whilst the control measures are in place, they very quickly revert back to, you know, being the social creatures that they are and wanting to engage with the colleagues that they haven't had the opportunities to engage with, you know, for a significant piece of time. Um, notwithstanding that, you know, I think some of the, the legislative constraints the government's put upon some of the organisations, and I know we'll hear later from from some of the kind of working panel you know have caused and will continue to cause some real challenges around you know vertical buildings in london with huge occupancies and and how you circumnavigate just the the logistical challenges but you know i i, I have a firm belief that you know we will see a recovery i think certainly the next six months will be slow as we start to to hopefully see measures 
ease a little and um, organizations um, adjust. But, but I think as we look to the back end of next year, the exit speeds, I think, will be very encouraging, both from a, a financial perspective. Um, you know, and I think to your earlier question with James, you know, th the reality is the food service environment will have to change, um, you know, and what we offer in terms of value to the consumer, whether that be, you know, um, different offers around take home and delivered to home services, personalized hospitality events, um, or indeed grab and go or graze, um, you know, type solutions, you know, ultimately we're going to have to change the offering and, you know, inevitably we, we may process the transaction in a different way than we may have historically. But I think the opportunity to grow the business um, is absolutely there. And I think the consumer will be more demanding, um, you know, and as um, business leaders, we need to be far more agile in um, meeting those needs. Um, and I think, you know, the outlook will be very positive. But, you know, there are some more immediate challenges for us to, to kind of step through. So really, we see recovery in 2021, late 2021. Is that fair? Yeah. Is the nation where you're coming from? Yeah, I, th I think if I aggregate next year, I'd, I'd probably see us as a, an aggregate getting to, you know, plus 80% um, of prior year volumes. I, I think the exit speed will belie it, something that is probably more positive and you'll see fuller recovery, you know, into 2022. But um, I think the quicker agile organizations that recognize the consumer demands are going to be different and adapt the way in which they deliver the office um, requirements, whether it be in or takeaway or delivered in through dark kitchens, we'll, we'll see the greatest success. Um, the ones that inevitably lie on doing it the way we've always done it and wondering why it's perhaps quiet will, will be the ones that will perhaps get left behind. So you see dark kitchens as being a particularly important the way, in the way forward, do you? Do you know what? I, I don't think there's a silver bullet to what we're facing. You know, I think if I look at, um, takeaway, delivered meal kits, dark kitchens, um, you know, collaborative partnerships. And, you know, we announced one yesterday with, with Grubby, um, you know, will be absolutely prevalent because as a consumer, um, I may in the immediacy of going back to work, you know, have confidence issues of being in, you know, large, busy environments. Certainly that will diminish after time. But, you know, I will still demand great you know, customer food, great um, experiences, and um, it just needs to be delivered in a different way. And if we can adapt to that change, I think we will be very successful. And to Simon's point earlier, um, I think the growth is there to be had, but we, we've got to do it differently, you know, and to your point, Chris, earlier around five years of change in four months, um, you know, being flexible and agile is going to be the key to the next 18, 24 months, I think. No, that's fair. Simon Houston bringing you in here because it must have been the strangest time to start a business in some ways. Um, it, started, it started yeah? the end of year one was a bit of a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> how, are you, how are you seeing things? Well, I, I, I think in some ways, um, if we started a year earlier, it would have been a bigger problem. And if this happened in two and a half, three years down the line, it would have been an even bigger problem. I think we're fortunately in this position now where we can step back, reevaluate what the next sort of year two looks like and sort of reposition ourselves quite quickly. And Lawrence touched on agility and flexibility just at the end there. And I think as a industry, we all have quite agile and flexible business models. But I guess, you know, for us, we're at the start of that journey, not several years on. So perhaps it's slightly easier but, you know, it, it still comes with its challenges, trust me. But I, th I think the, the, what Julian talked about was, was quite interesting. And the vested business model has been around for a long time. I think caterers generally have been quite good at adapting some of the key principles of the vested model. You know, that client relationship, that ability to really get under the skin of what clients want. Good caterers have been doing that for a long time. And, you know, I think those principles are more important now and will be for the next five years than ever. You know, I think that ability to really understand your customer, your consumer and your client and the differences between all three and what their, their needs are and being able to subtly adapt your model to suit those various um, requirements. 
you know, I think transparency, trust, relationships, the social community piece, you know, that, that, we've been talking about that for years, but I, this is just going to accelerate that all through. And I think those companies who can adapt them well and effectively and, and genuinely rather than forcing it onto the, the, you know, onto the business, I think those companies will do better um, at adapting to the next few years because frankly you can disagree agree with people's growth projections the truth is we'll just be working as hard as we can to deliver the best result we possibly can there is no doubt that new business tendering activity confidence of consumer that will all play a massive part in our future successes um, and i think you know it, it'll be very difficult for some to forget the last sort of four months five months and it will have battle scars for some years to come but we've just got to try and do our best to recover and be positive and and, and work with our clients and consumers as closely as we can that that's all we can do as a sector really that's all fair i mean james coming to you quickly one of the interesting dynamics at the moment is that young people and when i say young is 40s and under are actually wanting to get back into the workplace or start a life again and get back into London. People of older are actually probably showing, research is showing they're more resistant. So I think it's something close to 70% are the ones where the, where Simon was talking about earlier, that fear factor. I'm not sure it's fear, I just the reluctance to get back into public transport, get back to the commuting grind and go back into those offices. So what change are we going to see? Because we've got to, we've got to engage both communities, haven't we? You've almost got a double narrative running at the moment. How are we going to engage both and get them back in? It's a really interesting question, Chris. And I think obviously the younger generation definitely has been affected massively from a career point in not getting back into the office. Their, their careers have fundamentally been sort of put on hold. And that social aspect of going into work is about building relationships, you know, building alliances, getting to know your teammates and uh, building your network. And, and that's literally been stopped. Whereas probably the older generation have already built those networks. Um, so they feel secure and they feel confident in their roles and therefore it's not necessarily a transport issue. Maybe it's just they don't feel as though they have to um, connect with their colleagues. Um, I think that's for organizations to work out how they entice them back in. And I think, you know, young people in business need the appropriate leaders and that face-to-face -face with time with those leaders to help them navigate through their career path. Um, and I think, you know, we, we all have to make the effort to be in the office. I think the, the younger generation need the older generation and the older generation need the younger generation to thrive. Um, and I think having, having just a younger generation in is not going to be beneficial for a business moving forward. Um, well, it's one of the problems, yeah. It is absolutely one of the problems. And I think, um, you know, from our perspective, we're waiting for our clients to, to, to try and sort of work out how they're going to make their offices work. And like all of the panel have said, it's about being, um, uh, being able to adapt to their requirements. And we will continue to do that for a long period of time as we find out what they, what they all want and what everyone wants will be very different. Um, um, but yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a really interesting conundrum. But I do think uh, the younger generation are absolutely, they've had enough with uh, working from home um, generally as a whole, um, that they haven't got the space in, you know, to work from necessarily. Uh, the number of Zoom calls you have and someone's perched on the end of a bed, it, it can't be a nice working environment. You know, they're desperate to get back into, into the office, get some the social side working again and, and get their career you know, uh, back on the path that it was before, but probably in a very different way. And there is a need to re-engage the younger bit, isn't there? Lawrence, can I come on to you on this one? Yeah. There's a need to re-engage teams and get them feeling positive about the future? Yeah, yeah absolutely. I mean, it's interesting, um, to your point, I, I actually think the tide is already turning. Uh, I think a YouGov survey that was done this week um, sees that, you know, seven out of 10 employees are wanting to come back to work. Um, and, and I think that the reality of that tide turning as we get, you know, four weeks from now, eight weeks from now, I, th I think that will increase. Um, I think the demand for when they get back, you know, um, again, as I've talked to already and changing what we do will be absolutely key. But, you know, I think the younger generation are very keen 
and very um, astute around wanting to get back to work and the linkage to driving and sparking the economy um, to getting back to some level of normality. Um, and, you know, inevitably, um, I, you know, I actually am very positive, you know, put aside the challenges that w we will face alongside our clients around some of the immediate legislative requirements. But, but I think if I bridge beyond that, um, I actually see that um, the ability we have as, as business leaders to provide the confidence when, you know, customers and employees are in the workplace um, gives us a truly um, great opportunity to make the difference in employees returning. The, the challenge is being very forward leaning in that um, and being able to collaborate with our partners to get that message out there. Um, and, it, you know, it's fascinating, you know, if you've traveled in London recently, it is very quiet out there. You know, it is eerily quiet. But, but I think as we bridge the other side of the summer, that will certainly start to return. Um, uh, but again, it's just about being cognizant of the changing needs and whether that's, you know, COVID secure environments and, and how we build the confidence for people coming back to work, both, you know, staff and consumers um, and, and just being very open and transparent around that. Um, okay, no, that's fair. Simon, I know you're always a great believer, but Simon does know about, about talent, young talent, and the ability of young talent to find a way through. Always me one of your things, isn't it? It, it is, absolutely. But if I can just, because I, I, I wanted to pick up on the question you asked James about the different sort of demographic, the 40 plus, so the age group that I'm in, if you like, uh, well in excess of 40. Uh, I uh, attended um, via technology, uh, an Institute of Director webinar the other day, um, and it was very much uh, geared at that demographic, drip demographic of 40 plus. And I think what came out of it, and, and interestingly, Lawrence, Simon, James, and indeed yourself have all used the one word that was mentioned about why uh, that C-suite level of, uh, and I know this is not answering your question, Chris, but I just that's want okay, to give reference no, back. Fine. I do yeah. apologize. No, but good. the C-suite the level and, and just below that. So we are talking 40 plus. One of the, um, the key aspects of doing business is relationship. And you cannot, and I'm sorry, if someone agree, disagrees with me, please write to me separately and we can have a long discussion about it. But you cannot build a relationship like this over this. We all know each other. That's easy. I can say, yeah, Chris, do you remember this or James or et cetera, et cetera. But we will not build a relationship. Business is done with people you trust. And I don't care what anybody says. Julian touched on it with the vested. And that is why people will return to their offices because lawyers will need to do M&As and transactions. You've got to do that face to face. Accountancy I, 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 I'm going to jump in at this point. I agree with you, Simon. I argue that case constantly. But I have quite a number of people who argue the can and it is going to change, particularly international business. And international business will be done over Zoom, so you'll see less international travel, less international people coming into London because it won't be Initially, related to yeah. Oh, yeah, no, I get that. But actually, yeah. we will, particularly with events, events like this, you can suddenly see you're getting to wider audiences and bigger audiences yeah. than would have previously been the case. So, and actually, the point about it, I agree with the point, but actually people only come into London two days a week. Yeah. Well, the I think there'll be shift. change. There'll be change. There will be a shift. Of course there will. But the art of doing business is about trust. It's about relationship. And I, I was talking with Lauren the other day when she was explaining to me with EP, some of the events you've done, you are reaching globally that you would never have reached before. Absolutely. The transactional element of doing a merger, the transactional element of doing business you cannot do that via a screen. You need trust, you need rapport, you need relationship. And then okay. just finally, if I may, to answer your earlier question, I think young people have been hit the hardest. And it is the responsibility of every employer, whatever level you are at, to wrap your arms metaphorically around these people. Because I promise you, and I agree with Lawrence's percentages, I absolutely agree with Lawrence's way of thinking, when the business bounces back, you're going to need these people, these people that have just been sadly made redundant, sadly lost their opportunities, because without them, you won't have a future opportunity. So I think young people, if we've had to make some hard decisions, if we've had to make some 
at literally heart-wrenching decisions to let people go. And I understand that happens. Keep close to them. Keep them in your network. Make sure they understand that you're there to support them, that you are there for them when they need advice about how, how to move forward. Maybe signpost them to Hospitality Action or Springboard or EP. Help them because they will pay you back tenfold when you need them again. Coming back to your trust piece, because I think trust is a key part of this whole equation. Uh, and before COVID, we'd all talked about, I think it was 63% of people lacked trust mm. in leaders. And the, yeah. and the Deloitte Millennial Report of last year came out saying that majority of millennials, which are now just coming up to 40, so it's not young people anymore, um, do, don't believe businesses run on ethical grounds, which has been the real problem. I do wonder whether that undercurrent has been part of why people don't want to come back to offices. I think, I think you, that's a very, very interesting point. And uh, we, you and I, Chris, have had many conversations about this. So actually, it, without wanting to, 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 to hog the screen, I completely agree with you. And I think that is part of the reason why the 40-ish, 35, 40 are going, actually, quite like. but also do remember, we've got great weather. We've been super lucky that COVID's <laughs> happened now. Uh, you know, I've never had such a great tan. Well, I'm <laughs> glad you're saying that. I'm, a, I'm from the Scottish borders and it's raining. <laughs> oh, well, uh, so well, go. in, in, in God's own country of Hertfordshire, it's, it's fantastic. <laughs> But uh, the point is, it's not been a disastrous, cruel winter that we've had to work under. We've actually worked under quite pleasant weather, even if it's Scotland. Mm -hmm. So I think um, that does have a fact. But the trust point, you're absolutely right. And I think you're quite right to reference. There was also um, the PWC piece um, of earlier in the year, which talked about that. And I, I think we've got to work as business leaders, whatever size your business, in making sure that the values come back to what Julian said about that vested interest. And I agree with Simon, it's been around a while as caterers, we've been doing it, but that vested approach, make sure that your employees, your colleagues, because no business leader can do the job without great team that work with them. Now yeah. I'm going to move on. Sorry, go on Lawrence, after you. I was, I was just going to say Simon on that point, you know, that as leaders, it's, it's, incumbent on us to create that trust and collaboration um, because the reality is you know the, the future of the business and the hospitality industry that we're in is around the youngsters we're talking about you know and disengage them now and we are creating a very bleak future um, so it, it is absolutely for us to, to drive that engagement and and how we react now will define, you know, our industry, certainly in the coming years, um, which I think is key. Well, funnily well. enough, I'm optimistic about that. I think, that, funnily enough, I think this, change, this period of change can allow us to give young people the chance to take on leadership roles. Absolutely. Perhaps they, they haven't had the chance in recent times. James, your views on this? Yeah, I, th I think, uh, look, the young people are going to, not just the young people, but uh, they're going to be filled with some great new innovations and new ideas to help us out of this. And therefore, we need to engage them more now than we ever have done. They will have the, the, the new innovations and new ideas, you know, the new technology that we're all adapting to. Um, they will have that experience. Um, well, now you touch on technology. How important is technology going to be to what service levels going forward? I think technology is going to be a, a, a massive play. I mean, it already has, like you said, going back to it's just accelerated it. We've had technology in our businesses for a long period of time, but there hasn't necessarily been a necessity to use it. Um, now there is an absolute necessity to use that technology. We've all adapted to, you know, the, uh, the Zoom call kind of pieces um, to a certain extent, but it's actually the, the technology that we use within our catering environments that are going to be vital to help drive sales, make people feel safe, communicate with them directly of telling them exactly what we have, where it is. Um, and it, it's got to adapt. It's got to adapt as we evolve. Um, and there's some great bits out there. You know, we've put something fantastic together that's really helped our clients. And, and look, uh, we, we've actually seen that the sites that are open, the actual percentage of users for the catering facility has actually increased against the population because they don't want to go outside necessarily. They feel safe in their own building. We're providing a fantastic service with new technology. They, they, they feel as though they want to use it. Our uptake levels are up in comparison to the number of people that are on site. And, and as populations increase, I think that will continue. 
um, and that's what we need to capitalize on and capture. And, and, and we, need, we need to capture the data um, that is happening and how the buying patterns potentially might be changing through this process. If we can capture that, then that will be a real asset for us moving forward. And the technology we've implemented has the capability of doing all of those things. Um, and yeah, it's, it's great to see. And it's great to see that it's come to fruition so quickly and so well and landed so well and accepted by um, the, our, our customers um, with open arms. Because uh, that's always a challenge with technology in the past as new app-based technology, do I really need this? Actually, yes, you do, it will help you. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, gonna be, it's gonna be a huge part. Simon, Simon Houston. Yeah, look, I think technology is obviously an important aspect of reopening. I, I, I think I would agree with everything we said. I, I don't wanna sort of repeat everything. What, what I would say though is technology, apps, digital loyalty, whatever we talk about, it is only a tool within a huge toolbox that we have, and it's a critical one. I, I, technology won't overtake that personal human interface that we all really want. It will enhance the experience. And I think um, historically, consumers in our experience, consumers have been more willing to adopt technology. I think where we perhaps struggle to implement is through perhaps client restrictions, be it uh, firewalls, be it issues within the building. And I, it, it's certainly in my experience, that's always been a bigger blockage than consumers saying we don't want it. So I think this is probably a positive in that clients and consumers are probably going to be more aligned to roll this out really effectively. But I, I, there's been huge amounts of talk over the last four or five weeks about, te about technology. And I think if we can pick up the phone, talk, interact, good old fashioned customer service, whilst using good technology as a tool, I think, you know, that's a, a must be a pretty good winning formula. I think you're absolutely right, Simon. That personal touch is, it's a combination of both, isn't it? Uh, moving the subject on, chefs, because chefs is obviously the lifeblood of the business. Food is the lifeblood of everything. Simon, you come from, obviously from a chefing background many years ago when we first met. Um, there is, is it a, a time for real change with the skills of chef, the kind of types of chefs you're going to want going to change? Are we going to inherit people from the restaurant sector going to come into the sector? Because obviously, as I said, the stats coming out saying that 50% of restaurants face CDA, potentially CDA situations, which means there'll be a natural shift. How's that whole dynamic going to change, particularly when we're talking about dark kitchens and everything else? Me? Simon? Yep. Sorry, because there are two Simons, aren't there? Yes, no, sorry, no, Simon has no. Uh, okay, first and foremost, I think um, you know, chefs are resilient creatures. We all know that. Uh, I, I think the food service industry and the three gentlemen here are probably better placed than I am to, to uh, confirm. But it seems to me that for about the last three to five years have been really blending uh, celebrity or celebrated chefs or well-known chefs into the food service sector. This seems to be something that's been going on for quite a while. Uh, I certainly know within, um, within WSH brands that that is something uh, they've, they've enjoyed, uh, customers have enjoyed uh, for a number of years now. In terms of where you've got closures, I think it creates opportunities and what we will see, uh, and I've already been engaging through, um, as you know, my, my own common sense, uh, business. I've been engaging with a few chefs that are, uh, are now saying, well, I kind of think I want to do my own thing. So it's really interesting that here we are in the, the heart of uh, uh, what is uh, a, a changing uh, environment. The media might call it something else. Um, and I think people are being brave. Be people are being resilient. People are being um, entrepreneurial. And I think you'll always get that from young people. I think you'll get that from chefs because chefs are naturally like that. It's in their DNA. I think we're going to see some fantastic new cuisines opening up on the high street in the next 12 months, which will be as a direct result of many of these chefs coming out of where they were previously. Yes, I think there will be a migration of chefs into the food service market more than there has been. But I, I really, I think my last point on it is, I really do think that that shift has been happening for quite a while. And I, I know James, um, from the, the little bit I know about Bartley Mitchell, I think 
you know, they're working with Adam Byer and other great chefs. I only just picked one, but so I think that that shift is already happening. Lawrence, your thoughts? Yeah, no, I'd, I'd agree. That shift uh, absolutely has been happening. I'd, I'd, I think if I take a step back, first and foremost, we've got to work really hard to retain the talent, you know, that we've got from a culinary perspective within our organisations. I think it would be, you know, all too easy for us to, to kind of say, look, we need to right size operations and, and inevitably we will. But I think thinking creatively, creatively to retain that talent um, you know, and develop that talent will be key. You know, and I talked earlier to, you know, changing the food service platform that, that we're operating and, you know, whether that be dark kitchens, whether that be the formation of CPUs to, to create more efficient operating models or, you know, the, the delivered in solution. Um, for us, we're, we're rapidly pivoting the business to be able to retain the volume, but by engaging with the audience in a different way and and actually the heart of doing that is coming from engaging the creativity of our chefs uh, and using the knowledge and insight that, that they have within the industry so you know um it's interesting from a culinary perspective that actually culinary reports directly into myself because actually that's the lifeblood of our organization um and actually uh, for, for me whilst that's happened we've been very fortunate to retain the culinary talent within the organization and um currently that's pivoting us into into new spaces um but yeah no challenging times you know it would be remiss of me not to say we're going to have you know migration from certain sectors but but the reality and i think there was a, a question in the chat around how we attract new talent and will our doors be open um to, to um supporting organization you know like um hospitality uh, action and, and the like um, and they are pivotal platforms as, as we kind of go through the next um, six to 12 months um, and actually engaging young talent and bringing new talent into the organization will be the long-term success for growing out of the challenges that we're seeing currently. Um, no, we're running out of time so just a quick one to James and Simon sustainability we've got to touch quickly on sustainability we saw the result at the beginning of the poll that sustainability is going to be a key issue. Yeah. Um, it, it covers three areas, obviously, environmental, cultural, social. Your thoughts on this, Simon? Simon Houston? Yeah, I think that the poll says it all. It's going to be critical. I think the sustainability conversation has been around for a long time. It's accelerating and it will become super critical. I think there'll be a short term um, overlooking of, the, of it perhaps is the wrong word but I think the packaging piece and the plastics piece we've all talked about that perhaps will take a bit of a dent in the short term but I think when you look at sustainability I think you need to look at well-being supply chain transparency husband animal husbandry I think all those conversations will be critical um, and I think consumers will will really focus very hard on what we're doing as a business and I think that community and social piece interwoven into that again will be really critical conversations thank you james word. Yeah, no i absolutely agree i think one of the key things for us is supply chain and really supporting the local supply chain as much as we possibly can and the small medium enterprises um that you know are, have had some challenges um over the last few months and making sure that we support them um as well as a lot of the charity stuff that that all of us do as organizations and making sure that we're doing that they've been hit really hard and we need to make sure that because we're all going through challenging times that we don't cease that and stop we continue supporting our supply chain and our partners throughout this whole process um that's got to be absolutely vital but you know like simon says i think there's a bit of a um probably a focus on our immediate challenges ahead rather than necessarily sustainability at this moment in time but i i absolutely believe that you know, sustainability will be a massive piece moving forward and vital that we get it right. Chris, just, just to jump in on that, and, and um, from an industry perspective, um, we've recently joined the Responsible Business Recovery Forum through Footprint, um, and that's a great opportunity as, you know, industry to industry peers to collaborate and put, um, you know, um, uh, sustainability, well-being, uh, back on the agenda and quickly and work out how we really drive through i suppose the immediacy of the challenges um you know and, and it's great to see um in the situation we find ourselves that really open collaborative dialogue not just from food service but you know a much broader spectrum um you know in terms of manufacturing and delivery and supply so um 
you know, uh, to, to, to colleagues and, and businesses out there. If you haven't, it, it's a great opportunity to join that that um, program to to accelerate. Perfect. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you very much. We ran out of time. Uh, this could have gone on for another hour easily. So I really thank enjoyed talking to you. So thank you very much indeed for your time. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. And can we bring on the next panel, please? Hello. So let me just uh, introduce our panel because I'll be really interested in, you, in your thoughts as we go forward. Um, Jackie Cupper. Uh, Jackie, got Jackie and I have known each other for a number of years. I won't say how many. I remember right back in Sutcliffe days, I think it was when we first met all those years ago. Um, worked was the um, manager director of Aramark in the UK, then went out and worked in Philadelphia, in the Eastern Seaboard. Um, has been most recently the corporate services director uh, for corporate services group GSK, um, and is presently doing all kinds of different projects on a global basis. So we'll bring an interesting perspective. Uh, Stefan. Uh, Stefan is presently with Bruin Dolphin overseeing all, all, all their UK offices. Uh, Bill Brogan, uh, delighted that you're joining us. Um, obviously oversees catering at St. John's College in Cambridge. He's on the board of TUCO and obviously chairs the Food Service Managers Committee as well. Mark Arnold, who's presently with Lloyd's and was previously with Barclays and CBRE previously, so brings all kinds of expertise. Mark Williams, who has been with Bearings for X number of years and is really kind of one of the stalwarts um, and has a, a real champion of sustainability. So I'll be interested in your thoughts about how that's going to change, Mark, as we go forward. And Paul, who probably needs a very little introduction to most people, obviously from Newmora, and is one of the great figures of the city, city. So you've heard what the operators think, so I'll be really interested in how you see it and will it be different. Jackie, can I start with you? Because I know some of your thoughts in coming back are slightly different. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. It, this, this feels really... Um awkward for me on two counts, one being the only woman, um, but also um, I feel a bit poacher gamekeeper because I've spent most of my career provider side, um, a spell in retail hospitality. And I think when you put into play what those guys are doing compared to what's happening in the workplace, we've, we've got some learning to do in that space. But latterly, obviously from a, a client situation um, with GSK um, globally, few things on what we've heard so far. So the vested contract model was something we investigated um, quite extensively and really came to the conclusion that we were vested in nature, but not necessarily by contract. And the word that came in is one that Simon used earlier is, is that whole thing about trust. And a lovely saying that I heard that, you know, being in a relationship without trust is like being in a car without gas you're not going anywhere. You can stay as long as you like, but you really aren't going anywhere. So I think the trust thing, and never has trust been more important than in a crisis, which is what we have now. So I guess I've got lots of opinions, um, that's been said before, but I've taken the time to kind of go and do some research. And I've been speaking to a group of guys who are all, um, actually have a background in sports physiology. They're all PhD sports physiologists and they're working that and in nutrition. And they've actually done a survey about home working with 12 companies, but they've done it not only on people's opinion and their view and how they feel, they've done it physio physiologically. So they've measured with, you know, the ultimate, the Fitbit or Garmin and such like, and by an online app, how people's bodies were reacting to what they were doing, which is going to impact how productive they were, hence my conversation earlier about productivity. But they did about four and a half thousand days of um, research data that they collected. Um, over 10,000 responses. Um, they used an app, as I said, to look at people's cognitive ability and what they discovered about people working from home. And this is across all ages is surprise, surprise, their physical activity was significantly reduced by about 20%. Probably because they didn't have to travel. So the time that they spent exactly to the point, certainly about um, London, traveling to and from work, they, they didn't um, have to do. 
and then found it started to trend a bit better once people realized they were being less physically active. Um, they slept longer, better, and the connection between sleep and mental health and cognition is well documented. Here's one of the keys. Their mood was happier. They had more energy, more relaxed, less worried, less stressed, less anxious. And at the end of it, 52% of them said they prefer to work at home ongoing. 14% were indifferent and 34% said they didn't like it. I don't have the demographic data on that, but I'm going to tell you they probably do um, to know who said what. So I think be cautious that it's all going to be okay and they're all going to come back because I think there's a lot of people who don't want to do that. That's what this research says. And the cognitive testing that they did, um, which is very similar to some work that they did at GSK for us, where we set up a, a working environment where we wanted to test people, the impact of environment on people's cognitive ability. Um, people working from home demonstrated having better memory, um, making more rational decisions and less easily distracted. Um, and that peaked when they were happy and it dipped when they were anxious. Surprise, surprise. So, I mean, what does that mean? Um, if they're happier and less stressed and more productive, for the... why would they come back to the office? Do you, you believe it will be harder to get people back to the office? You think Potentially. It's yeah, I'm, I'm just going off this data. We can prove anything with data. Yep. This is a fair market sample done by guys I have huge respect for. Um, and actually, to be fair, a lot of this coincides with the work that we did at GSK on putting people in a different environment and what did the environment impact on their ability to, to work on their productivity and, and their well-being. Um, I think, certainly from food service perspective, I think personalization is going to be key um, in terms of the environment that they come back to. Um, so I don't want to keep referencing um, GSK, but if you look at the building on the end of the um, M4 that was built for 2,200 people, um, it's peaked at about 5,100 occupying, but average three and a half, four thousand. 4,000. Um, when it was open for people to come back, 100 people turned up and 39 people the next day. And that's a pretty well provided for building. But then you're gonna start having the problems of where in the building are you gonna put people? Because if that's 50% come back, you're not gonna let 50% go wherever in a large site. So I think it'll be then about where you put those people. And I think, Look, you know, I, I've used the saying, sat on the other side of the table, but food service is that primary service in the workplace that's experienced by everybody, whether it's a cup of coffee or a full meal or a sandwich or something like that. But I just want to put out there the thought that four months at home has probably changed people's eating habits. Um, I bet there's been an awful lot more cheese on toast, beans on toast, egg on toast. I, I could be wrong, but I think... Well, I, I, I think it was some research came out that people were buying fresh produce more. Yeah. People are producing actually enjoy what cooking. they want, the way they want from, from, from fresh goods. So I think there's something going to be there. Just to pick on some language, there's been some language that we've talked about, the difference between client and customer. And I think one of the challenges will be if you have corporations which are struggling against the backdrop and, and from the, the, the figures that we saw at the start, but where they're organizationally struggling, are they going to want to spend potentially more money on food service because there's less people using the service? And are they going to really struggle with that dilemma between corporate expenditure and um, what people want in, in, in the workplace. So I think that's been something that's, you know, been in the background for years, you know, with P&L models and, and such like, you know, yeah, we operated a global P&L model, you know, there were, there were swings and, 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 and roundabouts. But I think that's something that's got to be brought forward, especially if you start thinking about wanting food that is bespoke and is for me at a time that I want it. 
which is not necessarily between eight and 10 for breakfast and 12 till two, two for lunch. And against falling volumes. Um, so I think that appetite for subsidy is going to be important. Let's, let's, bring Mark Arnold, let's bring Mark Arnold at this point. Obviously, you've been mm -hmm. at Lloyd's. Um, what are your thoughts on Jackie's comments? Do you agree with that? Is it, what's it like? How do you feel about re-engaging people back in? Yeah, no, I mean, I certainly resonate with some of the things that Jackie has, has just talked through there. Um, and, and I think that re-engaging with the workforce thing is something that Lloyd's were working really hard on. Um, if I look back to the, the beginning of the lockdown, we probably went into only having 15% of our workforce in office locations across the UK. Um, and they were critical workers. Um, we're slowly starting to ramp that up. Um, we brought in wellbeing desks in a number of city locations for those colleagues that um, don't have the space to work from home comfortably. Um, surprisingly, we saw a really, really slow uptake um, for those desks, um, which surprised us. We were expecting the floodgates to open somewhat. Um, that hasn't happened. Um, I think we're now looking to, to towards the end of this year to probably 30% of our UK office population being back in the workplace. Um, and that's probably an ambitious target. Um, 30%, so ambitious. 30%, yeah. Um, well, if you've got 30% choosing to be back, or yeah, 30% so, mandated. So, no, so 30% is the capacity that we're working towards. Um, mm. The thing that we're trying to work on at the moment is that engagement piece with those colleagues that will fall into the brackets but mm -hmm. are able to come back to work. Um, and it's how we get them engaged to do so. What we're seeing where we've opened wellbeing desks in London, in Bristol, um, in Birmingham and in Edinburgh is that where they're using public transport as the primary source of uh, transport to work, the uptake is, is almost non-existent. Public where they can drive to work or they can cycle to work under their own steam, it's slightly improved. So the public transport piece for us is is really, really key. Um, Thank you. Mark. But also I think um, to Jackie's point around what do you do with those people when they come back into the buildings? Um, our future workplace team are doing a lot of modelling on the buildings that we have, um, working with business demand uh, to see how we can best utilise the space because um, we don't want you know, one floor with 10 people on and, and a thousand on another. You know, we need to, to balance that, that supply and demand out. Um, and that's becoming really challenging because, I, you know, I hear a lot of, about uh, businesses downsizing their property portfolio um, quickly. That's, I don't think, is going to be our experience. Um, we are looking at pipeline plans that we're in for the next five years and bringing those forward, but they will still be 18 months to two years away um, because hibernating or mothballing with floors or buildings or parts of buildings is a complex issue um, and a time consuming one. So for us, there's, there's a lot of elements at play here, um, but actually key is where we've determined that we need a workforce back into the office. Um, how do we engage with them? And the food piece, you know, for me, um, that's really, really critical. Um, you know, our, our caterers at the moment have done a, a really sterling job to keep 50% of our estate open. And where we are operating food services, it's really well received by those colleagues that use it. Um, but it is going to look different. You know, as we've heard from the operators, it's going to be very, very different when we start to open up that space more. Um, so how do we make that a real focal point for them coming back into the office? Uh, I think we'll see more collaboration, uh, people coming in for projects, for drop-ins with their teams once a week. Uh, and for me, food has to become the central point of, of the, the narrative to bring those people back in. I almost think that there's something, some of the conversations that have been going on about the, the retail space, about restaurants. And I think someone asked a question on LinkedIn about what, what have your experiences been? And it's about how you make people feel when they're there. Yeah. And that's going to be just as important in the workplace. So, you know, out there, I was, uh, first weekend was straight back to, okay, I want, I want to do my bit. Went back to our favourite independently owned Italian restaurant and felt like nothing had changed. It had, but it's the way we were made to feel. Went into a chain and felt like an inconvenience. 
and and it's it, the way you make them feel when they're there will determine whether they wish to come back as uh, Mark, frequently. Yeah, yeah, Mark Williams, that's something that probably stri strikes a chord of you, isn't it? Because you've done a lot trying to bring people together using food. Yeah, services. I mean, <laughs> are we succeeding? I'm not sure yet. Um, but it, it would, right from the outset, the determination was that we were going to counteract exactly what Simon was saying earlier, the, the images and photographs that BBC and the media like to use with chairs with tiger tape all over them and signs all over the floor saying stay back two metres, six foot, whatever we're working to. Um, and we were determined not to take away from the ambience, the atmosphere, etc., that we had in the office before people went away. So we put an awful lot of energy in making sure that we've created a safe environment, but exactly what Jackie's saying, uh, an environment that people want to be in, because if we bring them back to something that feels that they're sitting in the middle of a construction site and they're not construction workers and that's not what they signed up to, they're quickly going to revert back to, to home. Um, so have we got people back yet? No. Um, we've got the situation where the workforce is gradually growing in its requests to come back. Um, part well-being, part productivity, part um, just wanting a change of environment. Um, the problem we've got is we've got the C-suite that are making the decisions, that are the ones that are quite comfortable at home with some pretty large offices in good technologies etc and they're sort of putting it off the day when we open so at the moment we're targeting first of september um in the meantime with my team we're, we're we're going in on a regular basis every week or have since the start of all the lockdown um and those the numbers have grown slightly and every time somebody comes into the office currently who hasn't been in for a long while they're very pleasantly surprised by what they're experiencing um, and that's helping us because they're going out on their social media chat pages and everything else and sending photographs up on roof terraces and sun beating across some poles and all that sort of thing so gradually you can see the, the sort of mood change but we're working against exactly what Simon was saying, a, a very negative media that whenever something positive or something that would encourage people to start to be a little bit more adventurous, they quickly put out another story to try and counteract it. Um, we've also got the added problem at the moment. If you go on the HSC um, website, which is where we're supposed to be all going to undertake our assessments and everything else, and their first four lines are about stay at home, work at home, be at home if you can. Yeah, there's uh, a lack of that, consistency, that isn't there? That doesn't help. I mean, theory is that's going to change on the 1st of August. We'll, we'll see. Um, I have, you know, I'm branching out a little bit here, Chris, so pull me back if I go too far off. But I have the bigger issue that, you know, there is all this talk about, work from home and it's going to be there permanently and we've heard of organizations that are saying right we're not going to have the offices etc and at the moment i i saw sort of can relate to why that is I, I was a technologist by qualification so um i can see where the technology is working now and it allows it etc but the problem i have is if you wind forward a year two years maybe three I really struggle with if we're all at home and we're trying to recruit someone, how we start to convey our company cultures, our ethos, our beliefs, if we're interviewing in this little box, we don't have the pre-Zoom chat, the post-Zoom chat, etc., cetera, um, which starts to all become very homogenous. And how we're going to distinguish and recruit people in and be find that distinguishing factor as to why does that new young candidate want to come and work for us? At the moment, they come in, they see a, a lovely free gym downstairs, they get the great catering, they see the wonderful view, they see all of the social events and everything else we do and the, the whole organisation piece. And that's what draws people to, to bearings currently against some of our competitors. 
Um, yes, there's pay and all of those things in there as well, but it's very, it's very rare that you know a Bearings versus a Schroders versus a Rothschild. We all do the same metric analysis, etc. We're all paying in roughly the same ballpark fees, etc. And we're looking for something different to make that individual attractive to us. So I do think we've got this. I do think it's going to be a short term. I think what Jackie is saying is very true. I think for me, the biggest problem going forward is everything's going to become far more unpredictable. At the moment, we know roughly the numbers we've got every day. I think we're going to get far more of this flexible working of leaving people to decide, are they coming into the office? Are they working from home? And if they get up one morning, the sun's shining and they've not got an awful lot of work, they're going to suddenly decide, Actually, maybe I'll work from home and I'll take the dog for a bit longer walk today. Um, if they get up in the morning and it's bucketing down with rain and they've got a reasonable walk to the station, maybe they're going to stay in, stay stay at home. If there's something, go, a big event going on in the, the um, office or we're getting close to mid-year reviews, pay increases, bonus period, etc., they'll probably be attracted into the office. They want to be seen and... <laughs> And, and viewed and we get that now so we're definitely going to get it going going forward in this new world but that means for like catering and everything facilities is that demand is going to go up and down constantly without us necessarily being able to predict it so i think our reaction times and ability to to adapt and provide that personalization is going to be key Yep, I think that's some very fair points, Mark. Paul, your views on that? Um, well, you know, re-engagement is going to be really difficult, I think, to get people back in. You know, we're looking at even doing uh, mass antibody tests for everybody to give them that comfort to get them in. Um, but I think it's going to be a slow recovery. You know, there's now this uh, willingness where the boss wouldn't let the PA have it uh, work from home he's going to see that it works to a certain degree and so there'll be less people in the office and we'll have to work through that, which, you know, result with, you know, re-engagement of our vendors. You know, we've been trying to support them throughout this, really working hard with them, you know, talking to them all the time about what's happening. But, you know, every week we get, it's slightly different and our numbers in the building have not really grown, but I think September will be a, a big change. So Mark's big talking... Change. Mark Arnold was talking about 30% coming back by the year end. Your thoughts on what will come back? I think 30 to 50%. I reckon 30 will get 50% would be a nice target. But of course, that has an effect all the way down. You know, yeah, do you does. open your big restaurant, you know, or the gym? You know, the gym, you know, I need like 350 members to even make it worthwhile opening the door. Well, that's, you know, the engagement there is normally about 30%. So that's a thousand people. So what do we do there, you know, and the, the staff that you employ there and similarly with a restaurant, we've kept menu goes open because it's just coffees, teas. It's an easy thing to support, but, you know, it comes big numbers when you start turning on the restaurant. So I think it's going to be really interesting and a lot of change in the city. But, you know, I think next year, hopefully that's, that's, that's see, we, we can only work, build towards next year. We certainly budgeted that this year isn't going to be good right up to April and then hopefully you know we we see the city returning a little bit and maybe with the testing and everybody's comfortable that you know they've got antibodies or we can get injections that, that's going to be a game changer. Stefan, bring you in at this point, your expectations? Yes well we, we're learning as we go along uh, Chris. Um, we, we had a very successful story by reopening some of our offices in, in the region. Uh, I think that's been a, a very popular and, and having more and more people uh, wanting to go back to the office. Uh, but the transport is obviously not an issue uh, uh, when you live uh, uh, in a country. Um, and uh, I think we'll be having most of our offices reopened by the 1st of September. Um, and now we're looking to reopen uh, London offices uh, from the 1st of September. And of course, uh, there's lots of questions that needs to be answered uh, with a lot of concern. And, um, you know, as Jackie's point, she, she talked about trust earlier on. And we, we've been going through a very interesting journey uh, until now where, uh, you know, the, the government's uh, coming up with mixed messages. Of course, the media uh, 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 not stopping with a lot of different messages, scary messages. And we've seen actually our, our, our people uh, turning to the leadership team, you know, 
for, for straight answer because obviously they have the trust that uh, any company organization will want uh, the good for, for their people. And it's been a very interesting because a lot of people have been turning to us, you know, asking uh, for, for advice and, and, and knowing what to do uh, moving forward. Um, but, but certainly, uh, no more than, than, than 20%, you know, by, by October, uh, maybe 30, 40% by the end of the year. Um, one thing for sure is uh, flexible working um, is there for us uh, and will, will be there to, to remain for, for a very long time. Uh, you know, we were saying earlier on, once you've tasted that, you know, how can you go back to five days a week in the office, eight hours a day plus another three hours of transport? Um, and I think there is a, a strong element of uh, if, if productivity has not increased, it, it remains, you know, at a very good level, uh, but also providing some uh, good, well, positive well-being for, for our people, um, having a bit more freedom of uh, utilizing these two, three hours of transport uh, to do something else. It could be for, for your uh, organization or for your, your own time and your family. So, you know, I, I, I'm very excited about that because... Um, I'd like to see uh, moving forward a um, uh, big corporation that they will become a bit more like a, uh, if I could compare it to a, to a club, you know, where uh, you'll be going there to do your business a uh, few days a week to meet your colleagues. Um, uh, for us, you know, our clients, wealth management is about meeting clients and where we will be inviting them to our office. So there'll be the, the, the business element meeting and then which will be followed by some sort of entertainment. So, um, certainly less entertainment, but better. Um, and, and, and then all concentrating into, uh, into uh, specific days, uh, which I think will provide a, a better structure working week for all of us. Uh, so you you know, we're talking about... Yeah, I mean, as, as a group, you seem to be painting a picture of probably 40% of people coming back to the offices. It's probably generous, but probably at 40% coming back with the year end, which is going to put a lot of pressure on things then things hopefully improving into Q2 next year. Is that a fair summation? Bill, bringing you in at this point, from Cambridge, well, you're probably seeing something very different, I'm assuming. Uh, yes, I mean, we, uh, since the lockdown, we've actually been operating all, all the way through uh, with a very much uh, reduced service. It has been a takeaway service. Obviously, a lot of staff have been fell under across the, across the college. Some of the colleges have actually closed down, but we, we, we've kept going. Uh, so we've been doing a takeaway lunch all the way from March. That, those numbers are increasing. We have got still some living students that couldn't get home because they live around the world that couldn't get flights back. We've got some living fellows and then we've got some, some staff. More staff are actually now, now coming back as well. From the 29th of June, we actually started doing an evening takeaway service as well, which is quite quite popular and from the 11th of August we're going to do an evening dinner service for the fellows but only limited to six. Um, moving forward we're expecting to get most of the students back um, although the postgraduates have got a lot longer time to come back by normally they have to be uh, in by September but we're giving them to till towards the end of October because it, again, they're coming from around the world and some of these places keep changing their minds on flights and, and types of things. And even if you could fly to Britain as they deem to be quite a dangerous place with COVID uh, rather than their own countries. Um, so we actually think we're going to be very busy in the, in the autumn because um, a lot of these students will be dining in. None of them, we don't do catered to halls for, for anybody like some of the other universities throughout the UK. But as quite a few of the lessons are now going to take place in, in St. John's rather than in the middle of Cambridge at various places, although those working in labs will still go off to the labs. Um, we believe that we will be doing bigger numbers uh, than, than, than normal, quite frankly. Um, we've got three scenarios. One is we're just going to do a takeaway service for the whole till, uh, till January. The second one is that we do a takeaway service and we open up the hall for them to take their food into once they've got it from our butchery dining room area, which is our like, other commercial restaurant, and they go away and eat it in, this, in, the, in, our, in our large hall. And scenario three is when we open the formal hall for three nights a week, uh, where they can book, normally that's open six nights a week for 180 students each of those nights. We're looking to open it for uh, three nights a week for up to 90 
That's if the government changed the uh, regulations in terms of numbers. Otherwise, we'll just have to stick to um, probably the 30 or, or so, or even if we get, get up to that number. In terms of uh, staff working in the offices, I mean, my, my own catering staff, I, I, work, I head up the office there, and I've got a secretary and, and two managers. That, that right from lockdown, we've been in three days a week, and now they're in four days a week. The secretary did go on furlough. She came back because we're busy doing all sorts of things. And actually, most of the staff did want to come back. They didn't want to stay away. I've still got quite a few uh, catering staff, quite a lot on, on furlough. We, we talk to them on a weekly basis. Most of them are jumping at the bit to get back. But actually, I haven't got enough for them to be doing, quite frankly, to, at the moment to come back. But I will do in it's September. Taking off. And we've actually, we have a, a, a big range of casuals. We have one other thing, uh, and they served as well over the years. So the college did actually uh, put them on furlough to the end of July. From the end of July, we're just keeping six of our core casual staff on who, who work virtually on a full-time basis, but as a, as a casual for us. Now, how long we do that for, I'm not exactly sure. All our commercial business have been canceled, well, up until the end of September at the moment. And the college are evaluating what we do between October, and November, and December. In December, of course, we've got many um, commercial events uh, like we would have for Cambridge businesses and, and things like that. So and it's a positive side in terms of the students coming back. And getting all the students coming back is going to have a big input into Cambridge because they go out, spend money in coffee shops, this, that, and everything else. I've heard that some universities are probably not going to have their students back in the UK uh, till after Christmas. That, and I've been talking to them and they said that that will have a uh, detrimental effect on A, the university, and secondly, the city or town where they're going, because those students won't be there going out into restaurants, and nightclubs, not that they're supposed to go in nightclubs, but uh, bars and, and all. They won't have the students spending, spending that cash. Obviously, looking at the, at the beginning of the poll, sustainability was becoming a bigger issue in everyone's minds. Mm. Do you all agree that sustainability will take a step forward, or do you think actually, as some others think, they will take a step back? It's just not a priority at this time. Yeah, I I personally think uh, it's it's top of our agenda, but I also think it's going to take a big hit because with us doing takeaway food, the amount of thousands of things because we think we're going to be doing eight hundred lunches on take on takeaways and probably about 500 dinners on, on takeaway containers, although they are the compostable ones that we actually do send off. We've got a special contract where they go off and become soil enricher. Uh, so um, that is be better than just being uh, dumped. But the amount of money A, we're spending on disposables, and it will, it will certainly take a hit. Never mind the other big issue is that we're making all students and staff wear masks all the time, apart from in offices. Uh, Mark Williams, can I just bring you in here because you're a champion of sustainability. Do you think it's going to take a step back at this point? Um, well, I don't know. I guess it's going to vary, isn't it, by organisation? Certainly, certainly for us, it's not. Um, it's taken a step forward, um, and and a big step forward on a number of different business fronts. So um, it's definitely still centre stage where. We're actually launching a whole um, new internet site next week dedicated just purely to this. Um, our whole real estate business are just going out with a global RFP that is all about sustainability on building developments, etc. Um, so I'm not seeing it come back. Certainly the, our catering supplier, we're putting them under as much pressure as we were before COVID to um, take out the travel miles, the carbon, um, get produce to be local in season, et cetera, and um, get it as environmentally sustainable as we can. So, so yeah, it, it is very centre stage for us. Um, certainly some of the other city organisations I'm talking to are the same. Um, so I, I don't see it going away and I do see the, mo the momentum's carried on even with an empty office. We're still trying to do it. We're trying, we're even now, because if we do get to this point where we've got people working from home, we're now trying to capture 
how sustainable they are at home relative to when we're in the office when we've got all of the mechanisms and composting and etc set up for the waste streams and we're on renewable energy etc we're now trying to work out how we go around that workforce and capture the carbon footprint that they're generating when at home doing bearings business um so no it's definitely not gone away no so, just to add to that um and Namur actually bought a, a green investment house during the lockdown um oh, yeah, to, true. To, yeah so uh, that's that's going to start um as part of their you know environment so it's it's good so i think they're based in london and new york that's very good Jackie, your thoughts? I'm afraid to say that I think it will slip down the agenda. Um, not through intent, but because there will just be so many other things to do. Um, and I just want to flag again, I, don't, I just wonder how long corporations will wait to take the opportunity to reduce footprint. So I don't think they'll do it based on three or four months. But if you've gone to your organisation and asked them a question and 70% of people said we only want to come in these amount of days, how long are you going to take to test that theory before saying, right, we'll cl close building X, Y, Z? I, I just don't think the economy okay. will let that be a long time. And that's why I think people will be more focused there than, than on the sustainability. OK, if we, if we roll what you're saying forward a second, then city centres will change by the very nature of it. Yeah. And how do you kind of, how do you see that change? I think that's have, quite a structural change. I think you'll have more multi-tenanted buildings. And so the ability to provide services to a multi-tenanted operation, um, which is always more complex um, and brings one step nearer to the retail world, because that would be the, you know, you're occupying a space that could have been let um, otherwise. I think we'll see some of that. Mark, your thoughts on that, Mark Arnold? Yeah, so I think we um, have been very focused on the sustainability agenda from a soft services perspective. Um, that stopped when we went into lockdown. You know, we are on a you know, completely disposable offer where we're open. Um, and we're not really talking about those targets that were set in those environments at this moment in time. I think they'll continue to be there. And I think organizationally, they will hold us to account for them further down the line. Um, but I think what I am seeing across the wider FM piece is that our colleagues in hard services are really pushing hard to find more innovative ways of um, stripping, uh, whether it's cost or energy, carbon out of our <coughs> operations. Um, and that's where the focus will be. Um, as I see it for the next, certainly the next year, 18 months, it will be how can we maintain our targets um, by being as smart as we can be with our building operations, because that's where the big value is. Um, you know, we'll naturally see uh, a drop in, in carbon because of, you know, there's no travel happening um, pretty much across the entire business. So we'll, we'll see other areas take up the slack. Um, but I think when we start to get back to close to normal, um, operating across the catering estate, I think one of the first targets will be with our caterers is how we get back on track. Um, you know, certainly given that, you know, if we start to open up over the next, I would say six months to nine months uh, and start to look at hot food offerings, what, what our operator is saying to us is that, that, you know, that has to be in sealed disposable containers. Um, so, you know, to Bill's point, you know, everything that you do is it's going to be in a in a disposable box. So you know, we're going to see our use of uh, plastics increase um, over the next nine months or so. Okay, thank you, Mark. <laughs> Stefan, we're we running out of time. So Yes, well, just, just very briefly, I, I agree with Jackie. I think it will slip a little bit for a little bit of time, but long term, you know, it, it's there. It's a way of life. Uh, I don't think it's there to, to, to go uh, anywhere. I'll just uh, step back a little bit for, for a bit of time. Um, but naturally, you know, uh, less traveling, less people coming to the office, all this is natural thing that will happen anyway. So there is lots of positive there, even if we, we give a, a little uh, break, if we can call this a break. 
And do you agree with Jackie's comment that the footprint people companies will start looking at reducing office space as well? And that will change. Oh, yeah. Don't have to change. So, totally. Uh, you know, we, we're working on a on a big project for 2022, and we're uh, very much taking this in, in consideration uh, already. Uh, and I don't think that's going to change. We, we're going to keep focusing and making sure we, we're making the right decision uh, and that we, we, we're ready uh, when we're going to be moving um, to, to our new headquarters. So, um, yes, very much so. Okay. Well, th ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your time today. Again, this is a conversation that could have been double the time by ease. And I look forward to carrying on the conversation with you. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks for your input today. Thank you. And Tom Squire, can I introduce you, please, to the equation? Well, it, was, it was a really interesting dialogue at the beginning, wasn't it? It showed the result about how people view how alliances were delivered in. Obviously, well, it's going to be a real growing area. Absolutely. Um, and I, we always have to be careful about profiteering on the back of anything that's affected the world in the way it has. But I think you're absolutely right. There are solutions to what's been discussed in this forum and um, that will be driven by technology and a delivered in solution and perhaps more of an adoption to that than perhaps we've uh, we've seen. Well, welcome. I'll leave you to do your presentation. Just for just a quick introduction. Tom is the commercial director of City Pantry. Uh, City Pantry was last year acquired by the Just Eat Group which is now very much a global and, and actually will give some insight into exactly how they view the picture, which will probably be quite influential as well. So welcome, Tom, and thank you. Sure thing. Thank you, Chris. So the first challenge with any virtual meeting is to present my screen. So hopefully, Chris, perhaps you can confirm that you can... Absolutely. You can see that. You, you, you can see, yep. hopefully, a intro slide. I can. Perfect. Okay, cool. So again, first of all, Chris and Lauren, thank you very much for giving us an opportunity to uh, fill one of your slots during this webinar and hopefully provide some insights on how we think technology uh, and the delivered in model will start to uh, impact our industry. Um, so yeah, it's a pleasure to kind of talk to all of you today. Um, and what we want to do is to, first of all, kind of just give you a very quick outline on of City Pantry, more so so you can start to think about where our thoughts and insights are coming from. So who are we? Um, so we operate in primarily in the UK as a food delivery platform um, operating across uh, eight UK cities. Our mission has been from the very start is to change um, company culture through the power of food. So we, we, we think that has been uh, one of the forefront ways that companies can engage their employees, they can drive productivity and overall well-being. Uh, traditionally, our, our kind of mission was uh, to um, promote eat together Clearly, in, in, the, in the new world, we have to flex that a bit and actually think, well, that eat together uh, is not only in, in the office environment, but also uh, now wh wherever the, um, our corporate customers, staff are working from home. Hi, Tom. Just jumping in there. Um, I seem to be able to see both of your slides. I've got um, your, your notes and it's covering the, ah. just like you okay. said, it always works well. Bear with me. There we go. That looks better. How's that? Perfect. Thank you so Perfect. much. Cool. Okay. So yeah, just just to recap. So we are we're partnering with six six hundred top restaurants uh, in the uh, it, primarily in the London area, servicing corporate customers, and we're now part of Just Eat Takeaway Group. So again, just a bit of insight about uh, Just Eat Takeaway. They are a uh, we operate in twenty four markets currently. Uh, primarily, uh, we've got got a mix of business to consumer brands in there, uh, and then uh, obviously business to business brands in there. So all the way from Just Eat and City Pantry in the UK to uh, Menulog um, further afield in Australia. So when we think about our, um, when we think about our st stakeholders and how technology affects uh, those and particularly our model of the delivered in, we, we segment them into three separate areas. So um, we've got the restaurants and caterers obviously driving the supply side. You then got the uh, corporate demand generators, uh, our, our corporate customers, and then you've got the individual consumers. So what we would refer to as the eaters. So what I'd like to do is kind of take you through what we believe uh, these different uh, stakeholders are really looking for what sort of solutions they're after um, through technology. So then thinking first of all about the supply side, so just to kind of pull in some um, data points first of all, 
Um, so over the last five years, it's reported from 2014 to 2019, um, the, um, the uh, food delivery providers have doubled their sales um, from what, what, what we, we saw previously. So there's, even before perhaps this um, COVID impact has accelerated that, you could see it, it was a, a, a ever growing market and there's been significant increases there. Again, partnering some of our global chains um, as part of our, our wider group, they are expecting uh, material uh, sales impacts to last all the way through to at least summer 2021. So these are some of the biggest global players in the market. So I guess what we can derive from that is if they are predicting that with all of their extra resource and, and power marketing power behind that, then all the other players in that market will um, unfortunately probably also be heading into quite severe uh, COVID headwinds. And then kind of thinking about the delivering service. So at the moment, a lot of corporates are, it's, it's, they're unable to um, um, provide the delivered in service and same with the restaurateurs. Therefore, they have to think about other ways in order to fulfill their, um, fill their customer bases. So I think we've seen recently that it's not just the traditional um, fast food chains or quick service restaurants who are joining these delivery providers, but also you've got some Michelin star restaurants who are also appearing in these, uh, on these platforms because they, they need to find new channels in order to uh, drive sales, in order to adapt um, to, to the challenges that, that we, we all face as a group. And then kind of thinking about people who, who are um, you know, trying to operate and open their restaurants. I think some of the panelists made some really, really good points earlier. It really has to feel in a way like nothing's changed. But, you know, there is there is PPE requirements, whether it's for the uh, whether it's for the staff, the servers or indeed for the customers when they come in. And of course, they're going to be quite expensive and it's going to be a step change for those corporates. And again, I think the larger chains have to really feel about how can they bring that authenticity back in um, when actually they're having to operate it in, in a different way and conform to a lot, lot more standards. And then we have um, cloud kitchens, which again, you can call them dark kitchens, you can call them delivered in concepts or even CPUs. So I think these are terms which perhaps we weren't particularly familiar with, um, you know, even for the last few years. So this is something which um, is now becoming increasingly popular and the partners that we're talking about um, are, are looking for these. And the reason driving that, first of all, with, with a lot of things is, is cost. Um, so savings in staff and renting by operating these CPU or, or cloud or dark kitchens is something which, which they are starting to adopt more and actively pursue setting up those sites. Again, I think it was reported that Dark Kitchens uh, potentially is going to be worth a one trillion market by the time we get in, in 10 years time, by the time we hit 2030. Whether, that, whether those numbers ring true or not, it clearly shows that, that the, the, this is where a lot of people and a lot of analysts believe that these supply is going to come from. Again, what you'll need is tech integrations through, through to the logistics and the supply chain to allow those cloud kitchens to then connect to wherever the food needs to go. Again, whether it's in corporate offices or whether it's to, to staff who, who are more frequently working from home. Again, just trying to pull in a few more data points from what we have from our, uh, from our insights. So 52% of global consumers are comfortable ordering from delivery-owned restaurants. So that, that's the majority of people now are saying that they're comfortable uh, get, getting their food made where they ultimately can't see it. Uh, and they're, they're getting more trust in, in that sort of um, supply mechanism, where traditionally people like to um, showcase their kitchen, see the food preparations. But actually, there's this growing swell uh, that, that actually people are becoming more comfortable comfortable with this idea. I think one of the big powers of uh, data, so one of the big powers of technology is the data that sits behind it. So any marketplace out there is able to um, able to collate quite a lot of insight into what are the uh, most recent fashions, what, what, what is, what, where are people looking to create their menu choices from. So I think we did a study last year and it came up that you know, there were 15 different type of cuisines that the staff at our corporate customers eat regularly. So that, that's, that's a huge amount of choice that they are after. Again, some of the legacy providers in the space in order to try to provide that as easily and as, as seamlessly as possible, it, it's, it's a big ask to do that, to match that sort of choice and variety that you perhaps get from a, a more food tech delivered solution. Then kind of moving on to our, um, our, our middle um, stakeholder, who's our corporate customers. So obviously these, 
the, these corporates, like we've discussed in this call, um, quite a lot, and unfortunately we're using that phrase, new normal, that some of us don't like, um, it, it, it's seeing significant reductions in our in-house in population. So um, there's a general consensus from when we're doing our pulse checks with our corporate customers that perhaps come September, we will start to see this step change of people starting to return to the office. And again, we've seen things like 25 to 40% as being the type of workforces that we're talking about returning from September after hopefully a relatively positive uh, summer um, when people are starting to get that confidence back and build trust that they can actually uh, get into these offices and feel safe when doing so. Again, thinking about further afield, some of our corporates are predicting that actually come Q1 next year, perhaps only about 50% of the workforce will still uh, um, come into the office. So that's obviously a huge challenge. And I think we touched on it earlier, catering uh, is just one of those costs. But when you do think about the um, big office space um, that, that corporates are having to bear uh, month after month or quarter after quarter, then it's, it won't take too long for that perhaps to change if we don't see these office populations returning as quickly as we thought we might. Again, just trying to pull in a, a few more data points. So um, if we are looking at our customers who used who we were serving before uh, the COVID-19 outbreak we are actually viewing that these these customers are going to be permanently impacted or impaired by what what we've seen um, and play out over the last few months so we actually don't think majority of them will ever come back to where they were before um, the pandemic hit and that's driven through a, a reduction in simply office headcount on, on a probably permanent basis, but also budget restrictions carrying forward uh, over the rest of this year and beyond. But then conversely, and this is where we do think actually there are positive things for us to look forward to, the customers who we're partnering with since the outbreak, these ones are more motivated to uh, use a, a, a provider like ours who are able to um, they don't want their staff to perhaps go out as frequently perhaps the eater themselves is more happy ordering on a daily basis from a platform a delivered in solution so you've kind of got this converse between the customers who are pre-covid who again who are really struggling to come back but then you've got this these green shoots of these new customers who, who, are, who are using us uh, much, much more frequently so again it's, when we are looking to the future it's this balance between the old if you like and and, and the new and then I think it's going to be really important to um, make sure that when the corporates do try to welcome their, customers, their, their, their workers back, that they do it in, in a safe way. So, um, again, I think we're going to have to really think about the, the use of packaging because a lot of the corporates will um, have to um, get delivered in solution that they perhaps don't want to operate the traditional in-house canteen offerings the perhaps queuing systems the opening buffets uh, for, certainly for the short term uh, isn't something that's going to be desirable so again the delivered in contact contact free solution individually labeled in some circumstances to drive that convenience is something which i think is going to become of, of greater interest to, to our corporates and then simply people coming in and, and, and leaving office environment so if, if you do have whether it is catering related when you do have people coming in you really want to minimize that where possible or definitely know exactly who are coming in through the doors when we go back into our working environment so again it's essential if, if there are food deliveries then then we, we are trusted partners we're, we're visible and we follow the, the right steps to make sure that uh, everyone who is who is working in this space feels comfortable and then finally and then finally, we have our consumers. So again, just trying to pull in a few data points here. We, we, we said earlier that there's 15 cuisines that are typically ordered by our customers on, on, a, on a monthly basis. So clearly they value choice and the business to consumer market, I think has been giving a greater level of choice for a longer period of time. And, and you know, it, historically the business to consumer market has eventually followed the business to consumer trend so i think we're going to see perhaps an acceleration of that where um, the stuff that perhaps the consumers the individual eaters are used to experiencing at their at their homes you're gonna they're gonna want to see that more in the office environment as, as we go go through the return to work and then uh, just thinking about the on-demand and delivery services um so you know Covid has no doubt accelerated that. Um, I think a lot of the um, a lot of the data points that we're seeing again is, is that again I can't get too much specifics on the business to consumer world. However, you know our, our year on year performance and what we expect at the start of the year are significantly greater um, since since April, May, June came. So again, 
the outlook for the start of the year um, really didn't obviously foresee any of this coming, but actually the business to consumer world have traded really well. So again, if you think about the, the group mentality, you've got the business to business uh, businesses, and then you've got the business to consumer uh, sectors. Again, you've got this trade off with, with one that's, that's, that's struggling and impaired at the moment and another one that's kind of uh, uh, propping it up. Food safety, so this is something which has always been prevalent. And I think, again, what we, we are going to see is there's going to be prioritised even more. Um, the, the FSA hygiene ratings is one of our main benchmarks in the UK. So I think all providers now have, have got, so whether it's some of the um, B, B to C providers, have all gotten the ability for consumers and eaters to choose what sort of hygiene rating that, that, that they're comfortable with. But previously, perhaps we didn't see that. Uh, something that we've always pushed and tried to do. But again, I think this transparency and again, the T word trust is something which um, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure is now going to be even more prominent than it was before. And then well-being and social care. Um, a, a, again, this is something which I think it's been a really challenging world for every individual to balance and, and, and go through this journey that we've been on since the pandemic has hit us. So that the whole um, nourishing and the whole idea of, of what we are consuming and how it makes us feel has become really important. And I think the spotlight on mental health and well-being uh, has, has become incredibly important and it's become more prominent. So again, when people are at homes or they are in the office that they're, they're going to need to want to be able to feel like they are getting what they need out of uh, the food service industry and that is, is, is by eating food that they trust in that, that has the choice that has the sustainability that, that they're looking for and then perhaps thinking more on a kind of macro perspective of, about about what what we think the kind of tech world will will impact the, the food service sector so um we have already seen this year that there's been uh, more and more acquisitions in the food service space. So one of them being the fact that Just Eat was acquired by Takeaway.com, now becomes one of the largest food delivery providers globally. Um, and I think that that's, we're going to see more of that over, over the ne next few uh, months and years with perhaps the more legacy providers in the space requiring some more tech, um, some tech ideas or tech integration in order to um, show the synergies between between the two companies so again you've got the old providers who have a lot of that knowledge that experience that capability of being able to provide a service on a, 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 a nationwide or even global scale when you kind of link that to perhaps a, a, a food tech provider you've then got a really powerful engine and harmonizing those two together uh, we, we, we think it is, is, is incredibly valuable about where the industry is going to go so we're probably going to see a a smaller group of larger players occupying the market. And I think one of the silver linings that we've probably seen with um, the kind of um, um, COVID-19 outbreak is that there's been conversations happening, uh, which I, I, I'm not sure would have happened without um, such a pandemic hitting us. So again, it's the idea of having to work together. So these strategic partners are where we're thinking, okay, between perhaps people who used to be competitors or people who weren't quite in the same industry, how can we work together to provide solutions to, to, to the new normal? And with, with a lot of the um, acquisitions and consolidations that we think is going to happen in the market, a lot of the ambitions for these companies is really to drive the top line. Um, yes, of course, profits will, will need to come, but fundamentally to start with, it is about gaining market share and about getting that market share as quickly as possible. So typically when that happens, it, it opens, opens the door for more collaboration and more innovation. So I think potentially what we'll see is that, um, that there, this, this will benefit the end consumer um, as, as ultimately big bigger organizations look for uh, better solutions to provide to the uh, to the to the end consumer and this is something which we always try to make sure we we, we finish on whenever we're doing any of our our, our, um, our our communications internally is our reason to be positive um so relevance i think the great thing about um the hospitality catering sector is, is that we will always be needed so again people will always be brought together by food you know, the, the hospitality and catering sectors within businesses will come back. And I, I think the, the idea that they have a part to play of, of getting us back onto an even keel, making people feel more connected, we should really be proud to be part of this industry. Um, so a, a, again, we, we, we will be a driving factor in not maybe our just our, our city-wide or UK-wide recovery, but also our global recovery. And it's been really great to, again, bring people together safely through food.
And then technology, so it, it's a natural, like we discussed in this forum earlier, it's a natural solution to a lot of the issues that have been driven by um, uh, um, our, our recent outbreak. So again, I think we're going to continue to see a shift from the dine-in uh, traditional style solution to a more delivery solution. And again, that can't just be to offices in our B2B space, but it has to be to where our corporate customers um, uh, staff are. Again, food um, is, is seen as a way that you can drive great cultural benefits within an organization so that the hope and desire is that by using technology it can still be done cost effectively and then there's that no discrimination between the staff who are in the office and the staff who work from home again trying to make people feel more connected and on the idea of, of of making them feel more connected, obviously community. I, I think we've all been um, maybe surprised, but really heartwarmed by the fact that there's been a lot of community spirit and collaboration that's been happening since the pandemic has hit us. Um, so it's this feeling of, of actually feeling like we're all together and trying to solve issues together as, as they come at us. So again, whether it's donations to um, the NHS or frontline workers, there's all, all manner of people in the uh, in the food service industry who, who, who've done that. And we're talking you know, hundreds of thousands of meals have been donated um, at a time and obviously you know top line figures are, are, are struggling so i think it's really heartwarming to to know that, that, that that's that's been the case and I, I think you know the power of that community is something which which will drive us again forward as we we learn more about what the challenges we face start to become clear and hopefully we welcome people back into uh, a bit of normality into, into the office environment so that's the end of the slide that's so hopefully there's a few useful things in there um i will try and come off presenting and Chris, you can let me know if there's any, any questions you want to chuck my way. Thanks, Tom. I think that was very good. Uh, very interesting. Uh, to, to the question that's really been um, on my mind as we've gone through this whole session today is it must be incredibly hard when you're having conversations when people are so unclear about the numbers coming back and how they're, and actually how their own numbers are going to affect. It must, it must create a, or an underlying tension if you like for want of a better word in the overall discussion yeah yeah well if i think about us trying to provide our forecast even for the rest yes, of this sir. year that's probably the hardest forecast any millennial has had to do in their lifetime so <laughs> it, it, it it's it, obviously we all are predicting we all are, are trying to get our crystal balls out but all you can do is keep as close to your customers as possible um, and try to get a feel and ultimately don't go on what the media said and get that real voice of the customer and how they're feeling what their plans are and i, I think some of the thoughts echoed on on this call is are, are pretty representative of, of what we're seeing as so people are looking more positive as each day goes on i think you know the first journeys people have on public transport or the first time they perhaps go into their workplace people straight away feel like actually um we, we could get through this so we, we do think and I, I guess selfishly hope that september will start to see this return to normality uh, followed by hopefully that that quicker exit rate than, than maybe we all are predicting um but again um who, who, you know without wanting to try to predict too much um that, that's the current message that we're getting from our customers yeah no it's really interesting one, isn't it as an organization you've gone through dramatic change over the last 18 months 12 18 months i mean you've really you've gone from a london player to a, to a global being part of a global player how's that impact on the business and the mentality yeah, it's been it's been a really interesting one. Um, you're absolutely right. From being a London centric business to being one that that ultimately can be uh, looking at doing global partnerships for for catering solutions. So um, it, it's been an incredibly interesting journey. I, I think um, in, in a way it, we, we've now got the ability to, like I said in one of, one of the slides, to drive this recovery forward and having the extra leverage of a a bigger group uh, with extra resources in some ways deeper deeper pockets. We can try to make sure that we are providing that solution whether it means being more cost effective, whether it means kind of um, driving uh, new opportunities for our corporate customers that previously they didn't even think of, or even having strategic conversations with perhaps some people who also operate in our space. And that's become really exciting. And again, having, having that power of, of, of the group has opened some of those doors. For sure. well, you raised an interesting point because everyone, everyone thinks they understand the delivery model. When you're having discussions, do you find that people don't have a good enough understanding? There's a lot more to learn. 
Yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, there, there's a lot of misconceptions. So what, one of the most powerful things for us to do is simply just to show, you know, at, at a basic level, what 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 it what it means. Because um, again, people think, oh, it's just a dark kitchen with 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 a delivery to a front door, but actually, it's much more complex than that. Um, again, so you know, being part of a, a big group, it is a completely different discipline when you are doing a business to business delivery than it is doing perhaps a delivery to a front door. So the logistics that sit behind it and the supply chain required is is, is great because quite frankly catering for 150 people is very much different to catering for five or, or ten um so I, I think that's that's quite an interesting thing for us to do first of all to try to um, get that message across and actually show that you know there is a solution which, which will help actually one of the services businesses are used to getting in, in their office place um which can be done in, in, a, in a more socially distant way it's really interesting. Isn't it? And actually, have you noticed, because we were talking earlier about the two narratives between the people of an older generation and the younger generation, do you see that quite clearly? Um, I, I guess so. I mean, it, it's quite interesting when we are talking to some of our, our more senior stakeholders in our corporates. It, it is it's actually le maybe less about age, but more about the early adopters, the people who are perhaps not trying to predict the future, but perhaps seeing where the future is going. And you know, we are in the uh, technological revolution. I think there's no doubt about that. And uh, there is an evolution that's happening in, in the business to business market. So, um, again, I think you, can, you could say there's a uh, demographic swing in there but I think ultimately it, it, it's that having that foresight to look forward and and again getting our crystal balls out and think about where, where the world is going um, and there are plenty of sectors out there where you can see historically there wasn't technology in it now we, we, we look at it and again it's completely tech driven um, and, and in a lot of cases for the better it's driving more cost effectiveness and it's driving convenience. It's really I mean it's going to be the most fascinating year ahead isn't it it really is. I, mean, I, I think so. Um, again, we, we have various views of what's going to happen next year. But um, you know, if, if, I, if I look back at what's happened in, in the last uh, three or four months, um, I mean, that change couldn't have been predicted. So if you use that as a proxy of, of what, what the future might hold, then um, again, obviously, it's going to be an incredibly interesting time. And I think all you can do is make sure that um, you know, conversations like this and this forum, conversations with your customers and your stakeholders, whether it's supply chain or whether it's your, your demand drivers, um, I think ever more important if you don't have that voice then you end up missing the opportunity to actually help and support and, and drive change and drive that return to normality uh, tom that's excellent thank you so much for today that's thank you very much and very much appreciated thank you um lauren can i bring you back in to help on the wrap up yes absolutely thank you tom that was brilliant so your thoughts on that goodness any observations Absolutely. Well, I think it goes back to um, the point Jackie made. It, it's really just about how we make people feel. If we're trying to get them back into offices, how do we use food? How do we use collaboration? How do we use technology to make them feel like that is a viable option? And I think as being part of the hospitality industry, we are great at looking after people. So if we focus on that and we focus on you know, their well-being, even if it is them working from home some of, of, of the week, it's still very important to look after their well-being. I, I, did, I did notice Simon Ersman talking about there's nothing more important than coming together and having meetings. I did notice that too, but he's also very good at, um, you know, Zooming um, and, and meeting online. And I suppose that's just what it's going to be, isn't it? It's just going to be a mix of both. Um, that we, we will still have these forums, which is really important because if, you know, we're changing, everything is changing minute by minute. So knowledge share and, and conversations and virtual or otherwise, they've never been more important. Um, like Tom said, if we're able to work together and collaborate, share knowledge, then we, we can come up with solutions together. It's, it's not about competition, it's about the end goal. And the other interesting thing is obviously a real issue about the media and how the media have been reacting. Well, I mean, that came through very clearly, didn't it? Yeah. I mean, you know I haven't picked up a newspaper for nine years and I refuse to watch the news, so I get most of my news from you. But uh, it, oh I, don't, I don't think it serves us very well at all. I think there is, um, like you say, if we, we focus on what we need to do, not what we're listening to, and uh, we um, have those conversations directly, employers engage with their employees directly, give that confidence, build that trust, have that open dialogue, then, then it, um, it really is, you know, the, the media is, is um, background noise. And then that's, um, in my humble opinion, sometimes what it needs to be. Oh, look, there's a fantastic discussion there. Shall we ask that poll question? 
things yeah, on the poll question. Um, absolutely. Uh, great to, I think, finish on um, uh, a final poll because I appreciate a lot of information and knowledge has been shared. So I wondered how this has changed people's perspectives. Um, now that you've listened to the insights shared, uh, when do you feel that London will return to pre-COVID levels? Has it changed your opinion at all? Or do you still feel the same? Interesting. Still, it's still 2022, isn't it? It's going to be the journey back to 2022. The 2023 one is 23% square hard. What did yeah. we say that made 2023 suddenly <laughs> more appealing? Or well, never. <laughs> Uh, in advance. Um, there you go. Interesting, absolutely fascinating. But like, like Tom said, if only we had a crystal ball, um, it would make our lives a heck of a lot easier. But until then, we're just going to have to um, share knowledge and, uh, and work together um, to, to make it through. Well, look, thank you to everyone who's joined us today. Thank you to our speakers who have been absolutely exceptional because uh, there were some really interesting discussion points there. We could have gone on for a whole day having this discussion. So I am very grateful to everyone who's joined us today. Uh, we will be releasing this recording, or Lauren will be releasing this court recording tomorrow, tomorrow morning uh, to a wider audience. Uh, so again, this will be going out. So we'll be interested to see the feedback as we go forward as well. Yes, absolutely. Please do get in touch. Um, it's, it's very helpful to, to have your feedback and thoughts. Uh, and also just keep, keep your eyes peeled. And uh, we, we did say, you know, innovation is something and technology is something that we are embracing very actively. Um, and we're doing another session on, on that on the 29th. So we'll be putting out some information on it. But we're continuing to talk. So please feel free to talk with us. And our thanks to City Pantry for partnering with us on this. That delivered in piece is going to become more and more important and play an influence as we go forward. So it is, it is crucial we get these discussions going. So thank you and have a great afternoon. Thank, thank you, you very so much indeed. Bye.